NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lenders. Woo! As an adult, don't we all miss spring break? Nothing like taking a week off from all your responsibilities. Well, here's the next best thing for adults, a spring break from house payments. SaveWithConrad.com can help you get rid of all your credit card debt, just like that. We're routinely helping our listeners save five, six, seven, even 800 bucks a month. And you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this, but check this out. No house payments for two months at SaveWithConrad.com. Welcome to something to wrestle with. Something to wrestle with. Bruce Pritchard. Bruce Pritchard. Well, you know. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with. Out, Bruce Pritchard. It's WrestleMania season, and his meetings went long. Our plan was to record on Tuesday. Meetings. Our new plan was to record on Wednesday. Meetings. Our last, but certainly not least plan was to record when he finally finished up after a 7 PM meeting on Thursday, they stayed and they stayed and they stayed. And the result is a very special best of edition of something to wrestle, trying to get you pumped and ready for all things. WrestleMania It is WrestleMania season. After all, the plan right now is for Bruce and I to record on Saturday. Uh, if we're actually able to pull that off, we're going to be talking about victory road, 2011, which I was pumped to talk about, uh, because it meant we were finally going to be able to, uh, dig deep on what really happened. That very interesting moment in time in pro wrestling. But in the meantime, please enjoy a very special look back at one of the most famous and most popular WrestleManias of all time. WrestleMania 17. Of course it's Houston, Texas. We've got the gimmick battle Royal. It's Bruce's hometown. Brother love is in the match. And we all know what happened. The biggest main event of all it's stone cold, Steve Austin and the rock. And they're going to make a decision. That's going to change wrestling. And then we fast forward one year to maybe the most iconic WrestleMania match. The rock ever had against Hollywood Hogan. It wasn't even the main event, but it probably should have been. And maybe this shows the beginning of the end of the problems with uh, stone cold, Steve Austin and the WWE. We're going to talk about both of those here today, WrestleMania 17 and 18, trying to get you jazzed up for this year's WrestleMania. And of course, we'll be back next week talking all things victory road, 2011. Hope you guys dig a very fun, a very special edition of something to wrestle and let's keep old Brucey in our prayers. Our man is sleepy. Our man is tired. Our man is stressed, but Hey, it's WrestleMania season. Let's load the wagons, baby. We'll see you next week on something to wrestle. But for now, enjoy. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? Welcome back to America. Hey, good day, mate. It's lovely to be back, eh? Oh, God. I really thought we could avoid you trying to do bullshit Crocodile Dundee, but I don't guess, I don't guess that's possible, huh? No, I'm, I'm actually doing Wally, who was my tour manager, who was basically an Australian hybrid of John Paul Shellnut. Well, okay. Well... I don't know what all that means, but I know you had a great time. You were sending me lots of fun pictures and, uh, it it seems like you had such a good time that you spread the word to our mutual friend, Eric Bischoff. And now he's going to Australia in June. Well, he's going to have a damn good time. I can promise him that. So it's going to be a, that'll be a good one for everybody. I know I had a blast and the Australian audiences were fantastic. Uh, I, I just, I can't say enough. I, it was a bucket list dream of mine to go to Australia. I got to experience it and I'll definitely be back at some point. So chat me up. What was the feedback you got about last week's episode? WrestleMania 10. Well, I think everybody, <laughs> they all compared it to WrestleMania 20 and most of the feedback I got was all positive. It was, I think that we did a pretty damn extensive job going through all the different topics and all the shit that took place throughout. And I would also have to say everybody agreed that probably the greatest opening match in WrestleMania history was Owen Hart and Bret Hart. Can we also agree that you were mistaken and Barry Wyndham was definitely not there? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going for that. Okay. I don't give a fuck. Okay. (laughs) I like you're going to dig your heels in on something silly, but let me tell you. You dug I your- always dig my heels in on silly shit. I'm a heel digger. Wait, you dug your I dig heels. heels. I'm trying to make a transition when you quit stepping on me. Well, go ahead. Give me a countdown. And go. 
you really dug your heels in last year when you were a part of filming something pretty, pretty, pretty special. We expected it to be on air by now, but in fact, it was delayed a little bit, but the wait is finally over on Wednesday, April 10th at 9 p.m. You need to go find Viceland. These guys have put together a six part documentary series. I cannot recommend enough. I've seen all but one of them. Each was best, th- better than the last. They're outstanding. It's called dark side of the ring. Our great close personal friend, Evan Husney helped put it together, but this is going to be a documentary series that uncovers controversies, tragedies, and even some true crime stories from professional wrestling's golden age. And they have a tremendous lineup. You and I saw the Bruiser Brody episode, I don't know, two or three January, two Januaries ago, and it was phenomenal. And I said, then it might be one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. And they've only gotten better as I've seen more of them. And they're going to start out with a bang, man. April 10th is the match made in heaven. It's going to examine how art collided with real life in the mythical love story between the wrestling icons, Macho Man Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth. And of course, how it exploded outside of the ring with tragic consequences. And you're all over the thing. So was our friend Eric Bischoff. And I know Jim Cornette was a big part of this series. And is this the best like documentary series you've ever seen on wrestling? Uh, you know, they did their homework and it's going to be really interesting. The funny thing is it was so damn long ago that I did the interviews. I totally forgot a lot of even what the hell that we talked about but it's they definitely did their homework and it's going to be interesting to see how it all just shakes out in the end can't wait well i don't want to give you spoilers for what all the other topics are i think everybody who went to starcast last year knows the bruiser brody one is out there Uh, it hasn't aired yet but it's going to as part of this series but we're starting off with macho man and miss elizabeth set your clock set your calendars throw a reminder in your phone Wednesday, April 10th at 9 PM on Viceland, really a phenomenal job. I was super entertained by the whole thing. And hopefully you've been entertained by what we've been doing here for you on the show. Uh, we're bringing you a pretty special episode this time and it's WrestleMania X seven. Well, I'm feeling great about, uh, the hate I'm about to receive because I'm just going to start off. I'm gonna come in hot. Are you ready for this? Go for it. WrestleMania X seven was overrated. I disagree. You know, I, I, we, people have wanted this show for a long time. We're going to give it to you. Here's the thing that's, that I just need to caution everybody with. If you love the show, there's not going to be a whole lot of entertainment in this show because the best shows are the ones that we get to make fun of and shit on. And I get to yell at Bruce. So I'm not taking this stance of X seven is overrated to be combative with Bruce. I just think they fucked it up at the end. So if you want to hear me yell at Bruce, just hang on till the end. Uh, but before that. Let's just, you know, let's start from a a different place. This is something you've teased, believe it or not, when we covered no way out 1998. And you said that was actually the first time you remember there being conversations about folks trying to make bids on WrestleMania and try to court WrestleMania to come to their city. And you remember that X seven is really the first time that happened. Carry me through the process and how WrestleMania came to Houston. Well, there was a group and well, still is a group. It's the largest building management group in the world, SMG and SMG at the time had in 1998, I guess it was 1999 in that time frame, was, they were purchasing stadiums and they were purchasing, um, they built a lot of arenas. They manage all the arenas and they were broadening their horizons by going out and purchasing stadiums to manage as well. So SMG had just purchased the rights to take over management for the Houston Astrodome. Mike McGee, who was president of SMG, started SMG. It was his company. Mike McGee had been the building manager of the summit in Houston, Texas. He's the one who built the summit and he, his company managed the summit along with many other buildings across the world and Mike's company had just come in and along with Jeff Gaines, who at that time was the manager of the summit, they were going to sell the summit and compact center, uh, had the naming rights, but they were in the process of selling the summit to 
Joel Olstein and and Joel Olstein's church. But throughout all of this, uh, Mike McGee and Jeff Gaines came up in the middle of a show while we were doing a Monday Night Raw at the Compact Center, hashtag summit or slash summit. And they said, hey, we're running the dome now. We want WrestleMania. What do we have to do? And Briscoe and I almost at the same time said, pay us. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, you pay for the Super Bowl, don't you? So yeah, but that's the Super Bowl. I said, oh, fuck that. You want WrestleMania? Pay for it. And they kind of looked at each other and ran away. Shows going on and so on and so forth. And at the end of the night, uh, Mike and Jeff met with Vince and told him they were interested in having WrestleMania there and so on and so forth. Um, long story short, they came back to us and they created a very uh, unique agreement that enabled us to come in to Houston, come into the Astrodome along with all of the Astro facilities, the Astro Hall, the Astro Arena. We utilized uh, all of the facilities on the grounds for WrestleMania, for fan access, and to be able to have an entire week of WWF events. So that was the first time that a building and or a city had come in and said, we want you. We want you to bring WrestleMania here. We're willing to make it attractive for you. Now, it's nothing like it is now. However, that was the first one. That was the first step of being that that brand that the cities wanted and that buildings wanted to bring in. And they had no idea the effect that it would have on the city and the bottom line. And that's when those studies really started taking place and taking hold how much revenue that we would bring into a city when we would come in for a week. So this particular show was the model and the first one to, to come in and everybody wanted to work with us and, and we made it work. And it was, uh, the doings of Jeff Gaines and, and Mike McGee on the building side and on the city side that made all of that happen. You're going to give us an idea of what type, how the deal would be structured or what it looked like. Well, it was just made it so that there was no money out of our pocket. And in, in addition, we had, I believe it was the first national, we really had two national sponsors, but one of them had to be a local sponsor. The national sponsor, I believe was Mars, but it was a, we had a national sponsorship that kicked in. We also had a local sponsorship, which was gallery furniture, which spent a lot of money, uh, to make the WrestleMania, the success that it was locally and that helped because Mattress Mac, my good friend Jim McInvale and Gallery Furniture, they were looking to go national as well during that time. So it gave them an awful lot of exposure. It was, I don't know that there was a whole lot, and I, I don't know per se. I know that the there wasn't a lot of money exchanged for on the building side and the city side. However, there were a lot of things that were made available to us that wouldn't have been made available to us. In addition to that, there wasn't a large outlay of money on our part. So do you believe they absorbed a lot of that? Do you believe you got the dome for free or nearly free? I say we got an unbelievable deal on the dome and the facilities all around it Okay. for that use. And, and in addition to that, we got, um, promotional value locally. We were on, uh, roughly 200 trucks that were around the city Every single day, gallery furniture from the moment that, that Mac shook our hand and we announced WrestleMania, Mac had 200 trucks wrapped in WrestleMania logos and stars. His trucks look like the WWE trucks look now. And they were all over Houston every single day, 200 trucks. In addition to that, every single one of his advertisements, which he's on, you turn on the TV in Houston, uh, any time during the day, Mattress Mac was on Save You Money. And don't forget, WrestleMania at the Astrodome. Um, Reliant Astrodome. But it was 
it was a promotion that was absolutely un- unbelievable. And on top of that, when we went in to talk to Mattress Mac originally, it, it was we were looking for just such a small amount of money because that's what we were used to. And in the meeting, I've known Mac since I was a kid. And he says, what kind of money are you looking for? And before Bob Collins could get it out, I said a million dollars and Mac laughed, but he didn't say no. And he walked around with a very large check in his pocket is the down payment (laughs) for probably three weeks. And, uh, just waiting to give it to us because we kept on saying we were going to be in town and we would miss each other but he paid an ungodly amount of money. And when I say that in advertising that absolutely could not have been replicated and that nobody could have afforded on their own, but on his, his rotation, you know, about buying in bulk for advertising locally, Mac was on every station, pretty much damn near every break. And in every single ad he had either Ric Flair or Eddie Guerrero, um, Somebody, Eric Bischoff. No, Eric Bischoff wasn't on that one. He was on later one, but we had, uh, just everybody under the sun on, on those shows and Flair wasn't on that one. either. It was on the later one, but it was, it was insane. That's interesting to me that, uh, you still used a local businessman for that. And it was for such a gargantuan amount of cash, but nonetheless, an interesting story. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, when you decide that you're going to run a dome, how far in advance do you ink a deal like this with the city, with, with the chamber, with the building, whoever, how, how many months in advance do you know we're coming to this dome for this show on this day? We knew a year in advance. Now, allegedly behind the scenes now there, there may be multiples, but there is at least one guy who does nothing but work on WrestleMania. And this year at WrestleMania, he'll already be working on next year's. Correct. Before this year's WrestleMania, I mean, they, they were working on, you know, Tampa pretty much almost last year. Once they, once they had secured, uh, New Jersey, I'm sure they were working on the, the next one after that. Not just, you know, the actual building itself, but I mean, they start working on the stage and they start working on you know, where all the hotel, all the logistics of the actual show. And then just the massive undertaking it is to get all the other pieces of this show outside of the stadium together. Right. Absolutely. And at the time that man was Bob Collins and Bob was a promoter's promoter. He wasn't a marketing guy. He, he was a promoter. He came from Ringling brothers And he loved, he loved the hype. He loved getting out and creating new and different ways to promote events. So Bob eventually became the WrestleMania guy. And that was all he did. His, he and his staff worked on WrestleMania all year long to make it the biggest event. And you always have to be thinking ahead as to what's next. Cause once you get one secured, that's, that's the beginning of the work. Now you have to do everything else, but also in the middle of that, you have to be thinking about the next year and where you're going to go and what you're going to do with it. Then let's talk a little bit about the main event and we're going to circle back to it, but Austin rock, the two hottest stars in the business, how far in advance did you know that's the main event of WrestleMania 17, of course, barring injury. I mean, you could never predict that, but if everything goes smooth sailing, we want these two guys on top. When would that decision have been made to the best of your guesses? Probably in August, November. Probably so, in that time frame, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about WCW. And we're gonna get into more of this, but I guess I should say I'm not gonna let this this episode become all about the closure of WCW. And I think most famously people remember that WCW had their last night show just six days before this WrestleMania. And we're going to talk about that, of course, but I'm not going to talk about that last night show a ton because we've already covered it in our archives. at something to wrestle.com. There's a whole show on the last night show, but the thing that people really remember the most about that last night show is that Vince McMahon appeared on the show 
And at the end of the show, as, as Nitro is going off the air, you guys snuck a little commercial in there for WrestleMania, which is just genius. Carry me through the extra, you know, oomph you think that may have gotten for the show, if any, or was it just high fives all around because it was cool and sort of putting your flag in enemy territory? Well, uh, we owned it. It was no longer enemy, enemy territory, so we owned it. We were going to utilize every opportunity that we had, and the fact that we were able to do it on TNT was just one more avenue to promote WrestleMania. So um, been a fool not to. You've got it, and it's there, so use it. I'm glad that you said that because you said it's there. You've got it. Use it. Obviously we know that we're going to see some WCW wrestlers in a luxury box at this show. Was there ever any consideration in the weeks leading up to this, where it becomes apparent that the WCW acquisition is going to happen. It's no longer rumor and innuendo. It's real. Is there ever a consideration for, Hey, let's try to get this guy or that guy and do something at WrestleMania in the ring. No. And here's the reason why, first of all, that didn't take place until a week and a half before WrestleMania. The the finality of it, the actual purchase going through, so on and so forth. We we were out of the running, so we thought, and then all of a sudden back in, and it, and it took place, and it took place as we've stated very quickly. So when we got down, we knew what we had purchased. We had purchased the assets, and we had purchased the tape library and some other assets. But there was no commitment to talent at all because we didn't know what we had. We didn't have all of their contracts. And to try and sort through all of that in the time frame that we had, damn near impossible. So the, the main names, they were all under AO, AOL Time Warner contracts with huge guarantees that we were not going to assume. Uh, we're not even going to entertain it. Plus, I don't think that a lot of that talent would have wanted to come over at the time because they were getting guaranteed money to do nothing. So to, to that effect, it was it was a non-issue. In addition to that, we had WrestleMania booked. And trying to force something in there, there was preliminary talk of, you know, do we, the question was asked, do we use them in the Shane Vince match? Uh, is possibly bringing those guys in and from the get go, Vince was adamant. No, it's, it's not, it's not about them. It's about Vince and Shane and that it needed to remain that family issue and stay there. If you bring in other guys, it would muddy it up and it would just confuse them because the guys that we had, the very few talent that we kept on and that we absorbed their contracts, um, I don't think anybody would have known them anyway. They wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have been any impact anyway. So that was nixed from the get-go that it was, we're staying with the storylines that we have. Yes, it was discussed initially, um, thrown out there. Do we use these guys? And it was very quickly shot down because the story was the McMahon family story, not the WCW story. We would regroup after the fact when we know what we have with WCW and we would take it from there, but we still didn't know what the hell we had. It was all very, very fluid. And it just, it was a living, breathing organism. Speaking of uh, living, breathing organisms that you didn't really know what you had the XFL. I think a lot of people forget this is happening at the exact same time. ACW is going out of business. WCW is going out of business. The XFL Circle in the drain, man. And the March 26th observer Meltzer would write the business woes of the XFL continued this week with the 317 game becoming the lowest rated television show in the history of Big Four Network Prime Time, drawing a 1.6 rating and a three share for the Birmingham Bolts versus the Las Vegas Outlaws, both from a combination of March Madness and a fallout of the T's from the previous week not being delivered. That was doomed to kill the next week's rating. The UPN game the next night drew a 1.0. So just horrible ratings. And 
NBC responds by quietly sending word out that they're looking to produce inexpensive dramas for Saturday night next season. And in an advertisers conference, they start selling the fall season. The XFL is never mentioned or brought up. So NBC is already realizing, uh, we got to get out of this thing. When you, when you think back to this time of WrestleMania X seven, and you think about, you're about to have the biggest WrestleMania ever. ECW is going under WCW is going under and the XFL. Maybe not. Maybe it's better days were behind us. Maybe it was just better left as an idea. In fact, what's Vince McMahon like right here. This feels like he's got too much going on. Well, I think that Vince is one of those people that the more he has going on in some regards, the better he can be at this time. It was, there was so much shit going on and he, he was involved in every single bit of it. It was chaotic. I mean, it, it was just crazy because we're trying to take care of our shows in the middle of all this shit. You know, you've got XFL games going on. And by this time, I was so far removed from the XFL. You couldn't, uh, if you mentioned the word football to me, I probably would have popped. Um, so I was so far out of it and so far away from it. I I didn't want to know. And Vince made such an effort to be available to everybody that he wasn't going to let any one thing get more of his attention. So as to neglect anything else. Um, So for us, he was, he was very readily available and we were constantly talking creative and we were constantly looking at what's next. And for the weeks before that, you know, or the week before it was, all right, if we acquire WCW, what the hell do we do with it? And is it worth acquiring? And and it came down to the assets of the tape library. And that was all they were really interested in. Do we really want anything else? There wasn't a lot of interest in anything else. So for us on, on our side of it, it was the XFL wasn't so much even a distraction because we didn't get, you know, we didn't get hind tit. We were, (laughs) you know, we were, we were in the forefront and WrestleMania was in front of us. And on the wrestling side of things, that's what we were focusing on. In the middle of it, we got thrown in the monkey wrench with, oh, by the way, we need to go down to Panama City and produce the last Nitro. Oh, shit. Okay. And by the way, we've got WrestleMania coming up. And in the middle of getting to the biggest show of the year, you have all of this other shit going on. Um, The XFL for us was get them through their big game at the end of the year and we'll see what happens at the end. You know, let us know. But I don't know that anybody was that, that dug in on the XFL from, from our side, especially like myself, Michael Hayes and Brian Gortz who had experienced it firsthand. We were like, thank you, God, get us out. Well, Dick Ebersol, who's, you know, of course, heading up NBC says it's going to have to show a marked swing in the ratings in the postseason for it to have a real shot beyond this year, just from an advertising standpoint. He says that a final decision won't be made until the end of April, but really anybody reading the tea leaves knows that, well, we're about done here. And so is the experiment of Vince McMahon working with Jesse Ventura. He brought Jesse into the XFL to be a football commentator. And, uh, it's making the rounds of course, that because he is a politician that he maybe isn't doing the best job. And McMahon even comments and says he's on thin ice. We've made mistakes. And I think our biggest was our select our selection of announcers. We need football announcers, not WWF announcers. Our research shows people don't like him on the XFL. He's too over the top. Hyperbole turns people off. They know when you're telling the truth. Is it weird for Vince McMahon to say that? Because it feels like that's exactly what he wants in wrestling. Well, it is what he wants in wrestling. He, he, what he was saying is that the football audience didn't want that in football. So the, the conundrum was that football people didn't want wrestling. Wrestling people didn't want, you know, football. It, it was, it was weird. And the funny part about it is, is Dick Ebersol and the NBC guys were, 
big time in favor and, and really made a play for Jesse Ventura because they felt that Jesse being the governor of Minnesota, his high profile in the political world would get eyeballs on the product from an outsider looking in that what the hell is Jesse going to say now? What's what the hell is he going to do? That's going to be controversial in this other world. So NBC is just as much uh, to thank for that as anybody. And, you know, the XFL, the first time around, man, it was an experiment that you learned an awful lot that, you know, hopefully going forward that they won't make the same mistakes and they'll learn from the experiment last time. But it was, in many ways, it was two different camps uh, that, that would come together on a weekend and fight it out a lot of times uh, because you had the the WWF camp and then you had the NBC and, and UPN camps that they had different ways of doing business and, and we had different ways of doing business. So in between the two, you know, it, it was uh, different philosophies that didn't always meet that well in the middle. One of the things that comes out about the XFL is that it looks like you guys may be moving to TNN and UPN. The reason I bring this up, and we've did a whole episode on the XFL at something to wrestle.com. You should go check it out, by the way. One of the more underrated episodes we've done. TNN is where ECW was, and Paul Heyman would go on TV back in the day and and sort of blame the WWF or blame the, the network for falling in love with Vince McMahon and the WWE chat me up here. Do you think those were related at all? That what was related, uh, e, uh... ECW not be, you know, the WWE is going to consider bringing football to TNN. Obviously there is a relationship there. Talk to me about how that could have affected ECW in your opinion. I don't know that it would affect ECW at all. ECW didn't deliver ratings. That's the only thing that affected ECW on TNN. Uh, the football had nothing to do with that, to my knowledge. We've also talked about the death of ECW in the archives. I feel like I'm saying that a lot today. Uh, but they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy on April 4th claiming 8.8 .8 million in outstanding debts with only 1.3 million in assets, which meant the company was seven and a half million dollars in debt. And, uh, the biggest debt is to the family of Paul Heyman, 3.8 million. And Paul himself even declares personal bankruptcy in the wake of ECW going down. And, uh, this is just a, a tangled mess. We've touched on it before. Chat me up here about how this all came to be, because it does feel like a, a bit of a perfect storm. A lot of the guys in ECW's locker room were, were not exactly aware of exactly what was going on with the company. And then all of a sudden Paul Heyman shows up to do commentary. We just touched on this recently. He's filling in for a Jerry Lawler who just walked out. So, you know, where the King was now Heyman is and ECW is no Moss chat me up about how that all came to be and, and what the potential effect on WrestleMania and all of this happening at the same time is. Well, obviously Paul was in financial straits and looking to get out. Paul needed a job. So Paul had agreed to come in and work with us, uh, help out and creative. And when the Lawler situation came about, Paul was right there. He was a good fit. And I really forgot how damn good Paul was on color commentary until watching WrestleMania 17 this week. Um, he, God, he's good. Uh, <laughs> I hate to say that. I work with him. But, uh, but Paul, you know, it was no secret. ECW, they, they lost their TV. Their business was not doing well. Guys weren't getting paid allegedly. And, Paul was in a bad way. So Paul had to declare bankruptcy and Paul had to put everything in, um, to get out of the mess that he was in. And so when it all came down to it, uh, the same thing pretty much where WWE went in to take what assets and help through the bankruptcy court 
and do what they could. But we had helped Paul all the way through a lot of that. And then it just got to the point where no matter how much we helped, the company wasn't going to survive at that point. They did not have, um, just didn't have the structure to do it and continue on. And I don't think the talent had the confidence, but if there was anything that was really fucked up, the, there wasn't a lot of communication with talent at all during the whole thing. And Paul would be the first one to tell you that it was actually, you know, Tommy dreamer that turned the lights out on ECW, not even Paul. This content issue has been on and off criticized, not just here in America, but in Canada as well, including TSN. And there's some, some trouble here based on, um, the salacious content, uh, the questionable content, the risque content of Monday night raw and Vince McMahon doesn't exactly make anything better when he visits Bob Costas on the record. And they're, they're trying to pin him down about Trish Stratus being stripped down on raw and being forced to bark like a dog. And the timing of that is coincidental with a Canadian broadcast standards council ruling that comes down on April 10th, which is answering a lot of viewer complaints about the show. And they're bringing up may young giving birth to a hand and they're calling it vulgar, sleazy, sexist, and violent. Some real issues here. And the panel comes down on both TSN and raw as war for code violations in particular, violating the national television code regarding sexist portrayals and remarks made during the broadcast by the likes of Jim Ross and Chris Irvine, who we know is Chris Jericho, including references to female characters on the show as wearing a $2 walking suit, that horny little she devil, a filthy, dirty, disgusting, brutal skank. Uh, bottom feeding trash bag hoe. Yeah. Of course, the council is also finding fault with TSN for failing to provide adequate advisories during raw to give them a heads up of the type of content that they're going to be seeing. And as a result, advertisers actually start to pull out a little bit. Pet boys pulls out and puts a statement out. This is, uh, Interesting because it does feel like it was a prolonged problem. It feels like it started in 97. Here we are four years later. We're still talking about it, but clearly it's worked. All your competition's going out of business. Re- uh, revenue's never been higher. Um, but for whatever reason, it's finally catching up a little bit in Canada, but it's weird, you know, in hindsight that they didn't edit some stuff like when Rhino Gord, Molly Holly, they didn't, they didn't edit that, which I think's interesting. Um, what do you remember about the trouble with TSN? I, you know, I just remember it being another Canadian issue that, as you said, that there were some things that they edited, some things that they didn't, and they like to pick and choose. So you couldn't, you couldn't really tell what side they were on and what the hell they were going to be upset about or what they wouldn't. And they had the ability to edit every single thing that came into them and they had the shows in advance and they were able to. If there was something that might be the least bit questionable, we would inform them ahead of time and let them know, give them a heads up. So a lot of that goes on TSN. And a lot of that is after the fact that they might get heat from particular groups where they would react. They were more reactive than proactive. And we tried to be proactive by letting them know, hey, this is what we're doing. This may be questionable. This is something you may want to look at. And if they felt it was okay, they would air it. That was their call. They decided what went on their network and what have you. Um, Yes, it was controversial. And yes, it was a different time. It was a completely different time in society. Um, You you just have to, you have to do what it is that that you can do. But uh, those things were things that were taking place on the Canadian side where we were assured, no, everything's fine. And then, then they would be upset again over little things, but they wouldn't be upset over other things. So it, it just was a constant ongoing issue with folks at TSN and depending upon what got the public riled up or what got some particular watchdog group riled up at the time. Well, you guys certainly got Bob Costas riled up. I know we've talked about this a little bit, but this appearance is something that lives on forever. People love to 
show clips of this and highlights of this. It's Vince McMahon sitting down with Bob Costas on an HBO show on March 14th. It's called on the record, which was a new show for Bob at the time. And he's clearly trying to play gotcha, you know, a former friend of the company who was at every WWF event that he could ever get to and couldn't wait to put it over and ham it up and was a wrestling fan. But here, man, he's really trying to take Vince to task and his behavior is, uh, uh, questionable. You might say a lot of people were, were really focused on Vince's behavior here. However, a lot of people will say McMahon apologists would say, oh, Vince was a showman. He was just, you know, making it entertaining and being a little over the top, but it did get interesting at times to say the least. Of course, the, the first half of the interview was talking all about the XFL. And then they started to talk about the wrestling angles where we touched on Trish Stratus disrobing and barking like a dog. And then Costas is bringing up crotch grabbing and pointing at the crotch and saying, suck it and all that stuff. And McMahon just goes nuts. And he's screaming at Costas, don't raise your voice at me. And things get off the rail where he says something like, you know, shut your mouth and let me answer the question. Were you there for the filming of this? And if not, what did you hear back from Vince about how it went after the fact? No, I wasn't there. I saw it. And it was, again, you have two different schools of, of thought on that. There are the sports purist and the Bob Costas followers. And then there are the wrestling fans and the followers of the WWF that felt that they were being vindicated by Vince and his reaction was warranted by continually being cut off and by not being allowed to answer the questions and Costas bringing up, you know, he, he went to old statistics and went to old examples and had plenty of new shit to go to, but he didn't do his homework and he didn't particularly, I thought that they both didn't come off well. However, being on, on our side, it was nice to have somebody that would stick up for it. And yeah, Vince is a showman and Vince is going to make sure that whatever he does, people are going to be talking about it. Like you say, people are still talking about it today because of the performance. So calculated or not, people are still talking about it today. And he made his point and it was great television that people can point back to and go, Oh my God, you got to see this. This wasn't planned or was it? We'll never know. Go out of your way to find it. I'm sure it's on YouTube somewhere, but it is interesting because people, as you said, still talk about this. It's uh, probably as famous of a Vince McMahon interview that will ever exist. You know, when, when Vince comes back and discusses this with you, does he say, I mean, is it just move on? Or, I mean, is he really focused on that motherfucker, Bob? No, no, you know, it, Vince was on Bob's show and Vince knew, I think a, a lot of respects, what the hell he was getting into. So Vince isn't the kind of guy that's going to harp on that kind of shit. It's he did his thing and moved on. Now, when I say he did his thing and moved on, we're still commenting about it all these years later. And he has talked about it and used it, but would then take that particular situation and use it to talk about the XFL, to talk about WrestleMania coming up, to talk about everything else around it. So no matter how you view it, it was a beautiful promotional tool, um, good or bad to get people talking. Well, let's talk a little bit about what you guys were getting people talking with for the local promotion. This is your home market. So you're probably, I'm just, we've never talked about this. So I'm just leaping here, probably more involved in the local promotion of this WrestleMania than any other, just because it's your home market. Fair to say. Yes, I, I was. I, I was involved heavily in the, in the local promotion and just, uh, probably more so than normal. You know, we've talked about, and I think one of our best episodes we ever did was the 1997 Royal Rumble. Go out of your way to find that one. If you haven't already, it's, it's a time when the business is down for the company, but they swing for the fences and want to run a big dome show. So we talked about all the promotions they ran from Dr. Pepper cans, to Taco Bell offers and everything in between just to fill the place up pricing strategies, everything business-wise. 
what was different about this show or, or maybe if nothing was different, chat me up about what the local promotion looks like. You've talked to us a little bit about gallery furniture and master smack. And I feel like, uh, we've talked about him a lot here on the show besides gallery furniture and his spot load on every major cable network and the big four broadcast networks. What did the local promotion look like to raise awareness for WrestleMania here in Houston this year? Well, I want to say that it may have been one of the first times that we had a lot of major billboard. Um, we did a lot of billboards throughout the city for probably four months from January, early January on about WrestleMania. So that was something that was different. It was a major billboard campaign where we were everywhere. Uh, everything with Mac and, and it all does come back to mattress Mac and gallery furniture because he was the exclusive local sponsor. Plus he got that national exposure as well. So we were trying to help him in a lot of ways and him helping us local events. We were, they had a huge tennis tournament here in town. We had guys out there doing that. The Houston livestock show and rodeo, which is, probably the largest event that takes place every year in Houston. And they would have a stock show every year. Plus they would have, uh, the rodeo go on with major music acts, uh, every night. And that would be, that goes on for two, three weeks, whatever it is. Um, we had a big presence in that as well. So we, we partnered with a lot of people and the, the crazy thing, and I can't believe I'm, going to actually tell this story, but the Houston livestock show and rodeo was run by, um, folks, judges and, and just different, the pillars of the community, if you will. All right. Uh, people that have businesses and have a stake and they're, they're very big in kids scholarships and, and ranches and taking care of children and agriculture and what have you. But they're also some of the most cliquish bastards you'd ever want to meet in your life. And Mattress Mac, many years before this, had gone on and every day at the rodeo, at the stock show, they would choose, for example, a grand champion chicken. This is the best chicken. This is the greatest chicken that this child has raised this year. And then they would auction it off and they would get extraordinary amounts of money for a chicken. Then they would get, they would auction off the grand champion pig. Then they would auction off the grand champion lamb and every animal there, they would have a grand champion and have an auction each day for the grand champion. Several years before mattress Mac had purchased every grand champion animal that was auctioned off except for the main event. And the main event is the grand champion steer. That's the one that commands the most money. That's the one that everybody shows up to because it's the last day of the rodeo and the auctions and the stock show. So everybody shows up for it and it's a big, big deal. You buy the grand champion steer, you're on the front page of the newspaper the next day. Well, along the way, Mattress Mac bought all the grand champion animals. And when you buy the grand champion, man, you're on the news. Everybody comes to interview you and every single time they'd come to interview, uh, mattress Mac, he'd talk about, well, you know what? This grand champion chicken reminds me of the great solid wood furniture. We have at gallery furniture, 6,006, I 45 North between Tidwell and Parker. He turned every interview into a commercial, which really upset the hierarchy of the rodeo. When we went to the rodeo and we explained to them what we wanted to do and, and we were coming in, we're the next event in the Astrodome, they were all gung-ho until we said we're sponsored by Gallery Furniture. So the year that Mac bought all the Grand Champions, I say he bought all of them except for the main event, the Grand Champion Steer. The reason being, the higher-ups in the rodeo all got together and they said, this son of a bitch is uh, using our rodeo and using our auction is a commercial. And we don't want him to be a part of it. So they all got together. And when Mac was bidding on the steer, they bid him up. And they outbid him. They thought, okay, he's going to pay big time for this. 
Mac walked out. So they got stuck paying an exorbitant amount for the grand champion steer. Where do you think the media went? They went to the guy that bought every grand champion except the steer. And interviewed him. He says, well, you know, I guess it wasn't meant to be. I guess I just had, need to head on back to 6006 I-45 North between Tidwell and Parker and sell me some solid wood furniture. We've got a great sale going on right now. We're going to celebrate all the money that I saved today. You're going to be able to save today at Gallery Furniture. A master promoter. But the rodeo had a problem with us being associated with Gallery Furniture. So much so that uh, a dear friend of mine who was on the board – I went to him for help and I said, can you help me out here? And we had a sit down and it was like an old mafia sit down almost with some old, older gentlemen and IW Marks, Irv Marks, who was dear, dear friend of mine. His, his son, Brad, still a great friend of mine. But he sat down with me and with these other guys and convince them. It was like, and Irv actually said, he goes, no, I vouch for Bruce. And if Bruce says that, um, this is a good thing, I say, it's a good thing. We should let them do what they want to do because we wanted to allow Mac and us to go in and bid on the grand champion steer. And Mac wanted to buy that damn thing. So we, we made it so that Mac would be able to bid on the, on the steer. They were like, okay, he can come in, and Mac didn't want to didn't want to be a part of it because they didn't want him. So it kind of brought everybody together, and we ended up day of the auction for the steer going in, and Mac spent six hundred and sixty thousand dollars on a steer with Steve Austin there by his side, and Steve bidding with Mac, and it was all over everything promotion that you couldn't buy. Well, you could for $660,000. Um, but that was one of those stories that people shake their head at and go, what? It's a rodeo, but very political and very uh, clickish in so many ways. Okay. we got to run a timeout right now because there is something super fun. I can't believe this is real. There is a totally new, amazing way to get even more connected to your favorite wrestlers. And now stat hero is a part of your daily and weekly routine. That's right. We're going to show you how easy it is to play and win. stat hero is the company that revolutionized sports gaming by making winning consistently on your sports action a reality. And they've brought forth an innovative game to allow you to play real money gaming on professional wrestling. Bruce, did you ever think this would be a thing where there's like fantasy for wrestling? What in the world? Absolutely not. But hey, you got fantasy for everything else. Why not for wrestling? Because I think everybody at home is already fantasy booking in their fantasy having matches themselves. Well, here's an opportunity for the first time ever that you can play for real money contests. And that's a game changer. And it's all for pro wrestling. I don't know what you're thinking. How are they doing this? The matches are scripted, aren't they? Well, with Stat Hero, the scripts don't matter. Stat Hero has gamified the most exciting aspects of the match, so the action dictates who wins, not the outcome of the match. For example, get this, yeah, and get this you get power moves. It's worth two points. Off the top rope, worth five points. A foreign object, hey, that's a no no. Two and a half points. I mean, if your wrestler earns the most points, you win. Who's going to dominate more, the heel or the baby face? Who knows? Well, these contests consist of wrestlers across multiple matches. It's fantasy plus wrestling plus real money action. Stat Hero will match your first play. Dollar for dollar, win or lose, up to 100 bucks. Nothing to lose and no reason not to try. Go to StatHero.com. That's StatHero.com and download the app today. Restrictions apply. See StatHero.com for details. <laughs> Let's keep it going here. Uh, I guess we should touch on... You know what, before we get to the show, let's just talk about it. The video hyping up the rock and stone cold, Steve Austin with Limp Biscuit, my way. Is this the top five best music videos in the history of pro wrestling? I watched it twice, uh, in the 
in the open in the in the show. Um, I just went back because it was so fucking good. Yes, I, I'd probably say it's, it, it is probably the best. You had so much to work with, the, and the the it was like the the song, the lyrics were written for the match, almost. Good shit. Outstanding. We'll try to link it on our social media at Pritchard Show on Instagram at Pritchard Show on Twitter. Um, one of the all time best videos for sure. Let's get to. Uh, I mean, we can't really do it justice, so I'm I'm just gonna tell you to go find it or look for our link to it and enjoy it. Just pause what you're doing and go watch it and come back. It's it's that good. WrestleMania X Seven directly from the observer here in almost every way was the culmination of the wrestling boom. What an opening line to the observer. Do you agree? Uh, yeah. I mean, it really feels like it with ECW going down, WCW going down, WWF's hotter than ever major dome show, biggest WrestleMania ever. I think he nailed it. He And the two biggest stars in the business at the time going head to head. Yep. Much like the fantasy of WrestleMania three, which was the high peak of the eighties wrestling boom at the Pontiac silver dome. This show 14 years later was the all around greatest major show. The world wrestling federation ever produced. I'd have to agree with that too. While WrestleMania three was a good overall show in front of the record crowd. It had an atrocious main event that time and memories have been very kind to really only one great match. The in-ring standards of the WWF and the new crew of wrestlers have gone through the roof in the past two years, blowing away the quality of any previous time period. WrestleMania X seven had a few bad matches, but it's three best matches were on par and in ways even better than the main event of the stampede. And it was a four hour show with far better production. And it always seems better when the big show of the year delivers, as opposed to it being a monthly show being off the charts and then soon forgotten. Why do you think that is? I totally agree with that, but it does feel like this allure and the magic of WrestleMania rings true. You know, people still talk about a WrestleMania moment and I know it was a big moment when Sasha Banks and, and Charlotte Flair main evented a pay-per-view hell in a cell a few years ago, but it will pale in comparison to the women main eventing WrestleMania this year. Why do you think that is that? You know, the hell in the cells and the judgment days and the backlashes, they just come and go, but there is something about WrestleMania that just, you don't forget it sticks with you. Like people will eventually forget, you know, what pay-per-view you won the belt at here or there, but they remember what you did at WrestleMania because it's the granddaddy of them all. It's just the, it's the super bowl. It's the world series. It's everything. It's WrestleMania. It is the biggest spectacle of the year and that's the moment where people can can shine and make their moment because at that point in time they're probably going to be seen by the largest audience um for a special event than they ever will we should talk about the main event a little bit now because Meltzer obviously says this is the big story and, and it was and it's really the reason that I think this show is a little overrated. Meltzer would write the big story in the ring was the Steve Austin heel turn, which went ignored by the live crowd in Houston who were largely there to cheer Austin to win the WWF title by any means necessary. That included working a heel style from the start and gaining the title due to lots of help from Vince McMahon, even a handshake and a beer drinking toast after the fact. The Astrodome crowd largely ignored that McMahon was even there only seeing Austin win the title. And it was very interesting because the crowd watching on television led by the announcer reactions, no doubt reacted completely different than the fans in the building as shown on raw the next night while still in Texas. The Austin turn had been on the books for months, months ago. It seemed natural due to the ascension of the younger rock who had eclipsed Austin's popularity. In recent weeks, plans didn't change, even though the Vince McMahon standard of listening to the audience would have made him take a different path as even with Austin's nastier demeanor and playing the psychological heel role, the crowd was beginning to boo rock when the two confronted each other and the company was even having to confiscate signs at television tapings. Do you remember that? 
that this was the plan months ahead of time. The fans started to maybe shit on it a little bit because they're booing the rock, which isn't the desired result. And instead of pivoting and going with it, you start confiscating signs and just you know, first statement. of all, I, <laughs> no. And we, we knew we were going to encounter that because it was a baby face match. And when you have a baby face match, they're going to choose sides. The fact that we're doing it in Texas, um, 90 miles from where Steve grew up in Victoria, we knew it was going to be a pro Austin crowd. However, we also felt very confident we'd be able to tell that story. And on the build, you you had Austin, the, the, he was a babyface. Rock was a babyface. So people were choosing on the way to WrestleMania. We knew we would encounter that. Um, but also felt after you get over that hurdle on the backside, the association with Mr. McMahon would help make Steve a stone cold heel. Um, I don't know that Steve could have, you know, done anything in the middle of the ring. And I don't know that the audience at that time was going to boo Steve Austin. There was even a bit of me as I'm watching this and you listen to the crowd that I wonder if they thought Vince was turning baby face for, (laughs) for a minute by helping Steve. Um, and for the live audience and the, commentators they knew what story to tell and yes they were telling a completely different story on tv but going into it we all 100 percent knew steve was going to be the baby face the more heelish he was the more he was over as a baby face to that audience so no we went in with our eyes open on that but we were shooting for the backside of it. We went into it as a baby face match. We didn't try to, to steer anybody one way or another leading up to the match. We wanted the, the shock on the end, the handshake with Mr. McMahon and Mr. McMahon helping Austin out. Um, but that live audience, they were like, yeah, fuck. Yeah. Vince has fucking finally seen the light. Uh, <laughs> um, and that's just, it's a price you pay when you've got to get to the other side and the other side, there were different ways to go that didn't pan out due to injuries. Um, but no, we, we knew, we knew going into the thing and the decision was made, what was going to take place afterwards. And we were committed to it, but we also knew the bumps in the road along the way. Talk to me about when you guys made the decision for him to go heal. Um, God, December, because I remember just the, the going over it back and forth and back and forth from like January on and, and kind of the battles of triple H being involved and, and just different things and really wanting triple H to turn baby face as well. Um, it was, it was an ongoing battle because it wasn't just, the original, the original, original plan wasn't just Steve turning heel. It was to do the double switch right after that with Hunter for Hunter to turn babyface, and that's why you know the the whole Undertaker thing and at WrestleMania and he squashes Triple H and then after the fact, um, instead they wanted to go on a, a two man wrecking crew through everybody and it just, it changed right afterwards. And it, in my opinion, didn't change for the better. Yeah. I mean, I think you've sort of teased that before, but I think that's, uh, I mean, that probably should have been the way it went. Uh, Meltzer would continue even months back when the tease for the match began a rock interview where he started trash talking. Austin saw the crowd turn on him briefly by the final week, more due to tweaking of rocks character, having him punk Austin out a few times on television and be nicer to new employees. The crowd was split in their reactions, but it was a foregone conclusion. That wouldn't be the case at the beginning of the match in Houston. Every appearance on the screen of rock was met with heavy boos and Austin received thunderous cheers. Let me ask you this. How much of that do you think is them just cheering the hometown hero more so than just the television character? They're pulling for the guy. Cause by God, he's from Texas, a big part of it. And Also, 
you're again, neither guy was a definitive heel, both baby faces going in. There is a large, probably larger segment of the audience, man, they want to witness the title change. They want to witness history. They want to see, you know, they want to see the underdog win and whoever the challenger is most times is the underdog. Let's talk a little bit about, um, a bit of a change in policy that happens on this show as well. Chris Benoit is acknowledged as a former WCW champion who never lost the title. Paul Heyman is constantly referring to ECW championships that have never really been acknowledged before on the show. And you're even sort of paying homage to the past with the gimmick battle Royal, which is something you maybe a few years prior wouldn't have done like this. I mean, obviously we know what's changed in, in, in terms of business, WCW and ECW being gone, but why did Vince loosen up on that? Well, because we owned them now and it wasn't acknowledging your competitor. We, we had them at this point and it was, uh, just to try and, and change and acknowledge, acknowledge the past. If it benefited the storyline. All right, let's keep it rolling here. Um, the WCW talent that you fly in, this was a fucking flop. Was it not? You had Johnny Ace, Chavo Guerrero Jr., Mike Awesome, Lance Storm, Hugh Morris, Sean O'Hare, Mark Jindrak, Chuck Palumbo, Mike Sanders, Stacy Keebler, and Sean Stasiak. Um, you know, we see a bunch of these dudes in the box. I think a lot of people, myself included, we're curious, Hey, now that they own WCW, what's going to happen here? I think a lot of us assume there would be something happen in the ring. You've already explained why that didn't happen, but then it's this group of guys. Fuck. Why even bother? I mean, is that wrong of me to say? Well, no, I mean, how's it a flop? We showed them, uh, and that's all it was ever meant to be. It was never meant to be anything more than that. And people don't, you know, they always, you look at from the, from the bigger picture and they don't understand everything going on on the business end of things. So well, people I, assume, Oh, well they bought WCW. So Bill Goldberg's going to run in. Well, no, I get that. But at the same time, but, like if you're just going to show them and they're not going to do anything, I mean, was I supposed to be like, God damn Chuck Palumbo's there. I wonder what he's going to do. Cause I didn't, I didn't think that at all. No, and we didn't expect anyone to think it. We're just saying, hey, there's a presence here. And it was a reminder without harping on it that Shane purchased WCW and those guys, these guys are here to support Shane tonight, you know, watching, being a part of WrestleMania. That's all it was ever supposed to be. Nothing more. Do you know why? Is this just the old in case shit? You guys told the talent, bring your gear and whatever championship belts you have. And specifically... We're talking about tag titles with Palumbo and O'Hare. They're all told to bring their gear and those belts. And then as it turns out, of course, they're never brought backstage to talk to any of the wrestlers. And by the time they return to the hotel, the WWF crew has already left. Chat me up though. Can you speak to, is this just the old, Hey, if you're going to the building, even if you're not booked, you should just take your shit just in case. Yes. And there was also an opportunity, uh, if we had the opportunity then to, to shoot pictures with them, to get them on video and to do different things with them. That's it. But the idea that that's happening at WrestleMania, you guys are so fucking busy with everything else. I wasn't there, but even I'm like, oh, they don't have time for that shit. Yeah. But yeah, again, now, nowadays they actually, they, it's such a machine <laughs> that they do. And even then it was something that had that come up that we might've been able to squeeze them in and do some stuff with them, but it was more than anything, be prepared and, for whatever may take place because things change at the last minute. I'm just going to tell you in hindsight, you can always sort of tell when something jumps the shark, maybe you don't know when it happens, but the invasion jumped the shark at WrestleMania X seven, six days after you acquired it, it's fucking already over because the cutaway shot is of goddamn Mark Jindrak and Chuck Palumbo. It's not, it's not Goldberg or flair or DDP or nope. Fucking Chavo and Hugh Morris. Okay. No, that's all that it was. That's, I mean, why even bother? 
Well, okay. If that's if that's the case, then why bring in any of them over? Then it, it, to that logic, then why would you take any talent? Then no, no. If listen, we just I, done that, then we should have just bought the library and said, "No, fuck all you talent. We we don't want any of you," and and move on. I think that would have gotten our hopes up a little less than the horseshit you gave us with the invasion. Well, <laughs> bummer. <laughs> uh, I mean, again, go back to your guys that were, that were overpaid, had contracts that were huge that they weren't, you know, again, they weren't willing to <laughs> get out of or walk away from, they wanted to get paid. And I think if I was in the same situation, I would too. Oh, we know so you it's, get it's, paid. A, it's a business, it's a business decision where you just go, okay, we're, we're making the best business decision for us. Let's keep it rolling here. Um, Mount Sword Wright, China's career ending neck injury, which was supposed to give her an Achilles heel and explain why she's now wrestling women, saw China blow off the injury in an interview saying she was fine and then sell almost nothing in her title win over Ivory, which was a one sided squash. The only positive of which is that the fans see her as a star and the bookers know to keep her ring time short. Uh, chat me up here. Do you remember anything about this angle being dropped? Is this just one of those as the wind blows changes that we always read about in the observer? Well, I, I, I really don't know what you're, what you're referring to there. It was China coming in and looking to do something different with China. It was a logical extension with the right to censor and with ivory. And it became a personal issue with China. It was something that she hadn't done yet. She hadn't won the women's championship. So that was okay, let's go there. And we went there. Let's talk about, uh, some backstage news from around this time. Elsewhere, right. There was a couple of minor talent issues that surfaced during the week leading up to the show. The complete card was made clear after SmackDown the prior Tuesday, which led a lot of the wrestlers who'd been with the company on the road all year that weren't booked on the show at all upset about not sharing in the biggest payday of the year. By the latter part of the week, the word was out that virtually every full-timer on the roster would have a part in the show in some form, except for a few on the bottom rung. Then the night before the show, the plans changed and virtually everyone off the show originally was off the show again, likely because they were already doing a four hour mania and it wasn't good to add matches live to heat. Several wrestlers were vocal among them was Steve Blackman. Uh, because he had always done his job and been on the road all year and X-Pac who until recently had always been kept as one of the main players on the squad. X-Pac said he was going to go to triple H and when showtime came, many of the original people who were off the show were back on. So it does feel a little hokey pokey ish. We've heard about this before. We talked about it last week with WrestleMania 10, where a big tag team match was scrapped uh, in the middle of the show. What do you remember about this WrestleMania X seven card and how it changed a few times the week of to include or not include some, for lack of a better word underneath guys. Well, a lot of that just comes down to timing and too much show. So when you've got whatever you have three hours and 55 minutes of showtime for the event, there's only so much you can put in. And and it's funny, the same people that would complain that, oh, we didn't have so-and-so on the show are the same people that complain that X match didn't have enough time. And it's, you, you, you gotta serve an awful lot of masters. And as you get into it and you get closer and guys are asking for more time and different things, it's a happy medium. You, you have to serve a lot of masters and you've got to make it work. It's a jigsaw puzzle, putting all of that together. So sometimes shit goes away. Then you come back and guys say, oh, well you can take 10 minutes off my match or five minutes here, five minutes there. Well, fuck. Now we have more time to, to put, maybe we can put more shit on here. Again, it's, it's living and breathing and constantly changing and constantly moving. Of the guys on the main roster who were not on the show, you got Rikishi, who's out with a busted eardrum, Scotty Too Hotty, who had a neck injury, Tori from Tough Enough, uh, Billy Gunn, Al Snow, all Tough Enough, K Quick, who we know is our truth now, uh, Crash, Molly Holly, Bob Holly, who's also out with an injury. Big Boss Man's not here because his new gimmick 
supposedly hasn't been introduced yet. Uh, low down Kai and Ty S a Rios and Terry. So there are some folks who aren't on the show, but I don't know what you would have done with them. That's the point. And uh, yeah, you could, you know, you could have done an eight man tag there with some of those guys who would have cared. And I, I don't think that other than them, yes, it's a big moment to be a part of WrestleMania and I get it, but I also feel that there is, there's a, there's a place and there's, you know, there's a time and a place for everything. And some things, unfortunately, not everybody gets to go to the big dance. That's, uh, it's unfortunate, but that's just life. Could have put them in, uh, in that box with all those WCW guys. Sure. Just give everybody knives, put them in that box, tell them whoever fights their way out. I know you put $5,000 on the hood of a car and and anyway. (laughs) All right, let's keep going. Let's talk about the open of the show. What a fucking awesome opening video package. This is, uh, the voice over here. Is that Freddie Blassie? Yes. Uh, These packages historically at open WrestleMania are always amazing. We've talked about in the last few weeks. You remember who did this one? Is this David Sahadi? Feels like it should have been. I, it was either I don't even know Sahadi was there at that time. If it wasn't Sahadi, it was Adam Panucci. Well, whoever but it was, uh, tip of the cap to you. God damn, is good. Uh, we've previously discussed why King isn't here. Um, how nervous were you about putting Paul Heyman in that spot here for WrestleMania? Really, not at all, because Paul and Jr. had worked previously in. WCW, they had good chemistry and Paul knew the stories. Paul, you know, shit, Paul knew the stories better than Lawler did ever. Paul, Paul was up on it and, and listening to it, as I said, in the very beginning, um, Paul added an awful lot to this show and, and fuck, he was, he was on his game here, not over the top, just telling great stories and getting talent over. Was there ever any discussion to trying to get a WCW announcer here? I mean, a Tony Schiavone or a Mike Tanay or any of those guys, since you've got their contracts now too. No, okay. I don't think we had their contracts. They uh, weren't people that we absorbed. Yeah, I had to get a limbo. All right. Uh, Chris Jericho is in your first match. She's working with William Regal. They're going to go seven minutes and eight seconds. They only got two stars. Uh, but, uh, Jericho gets the win when he, uh, earns a pinfall and retains his intercontinental title. Meltzer will say match was fine in some ways. Well, wrestled by Regal, although Jericho had one of those matches where he was slightly off on things where it ended up disappointing is that it was just too short. Uh, what'd you think of the match? I actually dug it. Uh, these are two of my favorites though. So I think I would be entertained by nearly anything they put out. I thought it was an excellent opener. And it, it set the stage. They went out and they wrestled a solid match. Um, probably cause it was in the wrong dome. Maybe why he didn't like it, but it was, it was solid. It was stiff and they put on a hell of a show and it was a great story leading up to it with Jericho and Regal kind of going back and forth, but I found it highly entertaining. Let's, uh, let's keep it rolling here and let's talk about the next match. Um, well, I guess we should touch base on and i know we've talked about this for sure with regal the way they built this program is the pt segment uh, which is one of your favorite segments refresh everybody's memory about what the hot issue here with jericho and regal was well not pt but the p in the t uh (laughs) for a minute i had to go pt uh jericho urinated in william regal's afternoon tea and regal drank it and felt it had a little twang to it. So that was one of the many things leading up to this, but it was, again, it was two guys that could talk and two guys that could wrestle that really delivered in the match. And it was a great way to start off the night. It was indeed. And, uh, next up was a a backstage vignette that you really enjoyed. Well, yeah, you got APA and Jackie and Ron Simmons there, which just kind of set the stage for what was to come next. But going back and watching this was like, holy shit. Um, Bradshaw was actually ripped 
and, and John getting into character kind of set the stage talking about Texas and the Astrodome and all the things that had taken place, but it was a way to even get that Texas crowd all that much more behind APA and Jackie as we go into the next one. The next one is Bradshaw and Farouk teaming with Taz with two Z's to be Godfather, Bull Buchanan and Val Venus. You know, I'm going to take a time out here to find out exactly how you guys were able to skirt around trademark or copyright law or whatever and say that no Taz with two Z's is definitely different than Taz with one Z. It's got two Z's. You have no idea how, how many times I tried to convince Taz to get an extra Z put on his little tattoo on his arm. I said, you know, it'd really be good if you would just commit to this gimmick and get an extra Z on your arm. Never did. No, I mean, same, the same way that, that ECW got away with calling him Taz all those years, just in general. Well, but in fairness, they called him Taz and you would always say in front of 1200 people in a bingo hall. And now right. this is a worldwide enterprise known for its licensing agreements globally. And you somehow argue at least enough to do it. That one Z makes it different. Right. That's because it does. I mean, technically he was Taz technically. If impact had rolled out an under faker character, I mean, would they have gotten away with it? Cause that's different. It's not a T it's an F they made a loop on the T there's a, there's a yeah, loop. But it's still, if they portrayed it as the same character. Oh no, he we're was, not saying we're not, we didn't say that Taz was in any way related to anything else. That was just a name. No, no, I get it. But like this under faker character, he could have been like a, an insurance salesman, you know, just nothing. I mean, he's not like a. Like he's not here for your yeah, soul. that's for lawyers to deal with. Yeah. I just uh, want Taz to get an extra Z on his arm. The match ends abruptly here when the good father said the godfather, but he's actually the good father here, uh, misses a tackle into the buckles and Bradshaw pins him with that clothesline from hell. Uh, nothing to the match, half a star in and out three minutes, 53 seconds, but Hey, you got everybody on the show. Anything else you want to mention about this one? It was an ugly, ugly brawl, but, uh, thankfully kept very brief. Bradshaw really had the standout moment backstage and here in the match, he gets the win. Did you have any sort of plans or ambition for him to be a single star yet at this point here in one kind of, and this was during a time that Vince felt that both of those guys would, would do better on their own singly. Um, but the more that we would try to go in that direction, a lot of times, the more we'd shift back and people wanted that APA tag team all that much more. So it was, um, yes, to answer your question. Yeah, there, there was, this was the beginning of these guys could be great singles and it's time to move them from the tag team. It just didn't, didn't pull that trigger for quite a while. You want to talk about anything else backstage? You want to get to the next match? Well, you know, the, the next deal backstage had Trish wheeling Linda down the hall where she was in a comatose stage and just, you know, watching it then as they ran into Stephanie McMahon backstage was I've, I've done it just trying to focus on one thing and Linda McMahon's performance throughout all of this was really great just to try and keep a straight face and try and focus and and not watch all the different shit and react to a lot of the stuff that was going on. And to me, that was underrated just going back and watching that and going, Hmm. All right. That was interesting. Well, I didn't know how you would classify Linda and Trish in this segment. So I'm glad we at least got to got you to talk about it a little bit. Let's get to uh Kane. Winning the hardcore title over Raven and Big Show, nine minutes, 18 seconds. No Pete Rose this time at WrestleMania in the Kane match. And they try to do something different here, to say the least. They're brawling all the way through the back. They've got these, uh, it looks like you guys built some rooms for them just to tear down and go through the glass window, go through the wall. I mean, people are running into each other with golf carts. It's pretty crazy. But it is fun. I mean, I have to give it props for that. 
It only got a star in three quarters. I thought it was much more fun than that. What'd you think? Well, a little too much backstage for me. And, and it's funny. You say, oh, you people built uh, rooms and shit backstage. Again, that goes to the rumor and innuendo because there was a wall built in rooms that were already there. And the fact that we went through a wall that they weren't supposed to go through and people just assume that they assume everything's gimmick because a few things are gimmicked. And that's why I just have to chuckle sometimes because that, well, no one said that I, I just made that up, but just watching it, it feels like, boy, if, if, if someone actually paid a contractor for that, somebody needs to call their mama. Yeah. No, the, the, the outside wall in the room was there. And then we utilized, you know, the, the gimmick glass and, and built a gimmick wall in there, but it was, um, yeah, one of those walls took a hell of a beating from, I think big show or Kane, one of the two. And then when Raven got on the damn golf cart with big show and it just was, I guess, too much weight and, and ran off and went into the damn thing. There was supposed to be a little chase there with Kane getting on the golf court and chasing Raven and show backstage through that area a little bit. And they had to quickly change plans up a little bit and, and fight to where they needed to get to. But that was, <laughs> I remember it when it happened going, Oh shit. Um, hoping everybody was okay. Cause that damn thing could have gone off the edge and, but it was, it was good. It was fun. It was it was a hardcore match. I wish more of it would have taken place in front of the audience, but I also understand why we did what we did and it accomplished what it set out to accomplish. I enjoyed it. It's, it's a sleeper match here on the show. Go check it out. Uh, sort of silly, sort of fun. The golf cart chase, uh, was maybe the part that people sort of poke fun at going through the window though. Something everybody still talks about. Uh, you want to talk about the backstage stuff or just get to the next match? Well, no, the, ba the backstage stuff well, it was, was good shit and it, it was good for what it was and made it all, made it all work. And then from that, going back to Kurt angle, watching over and over Chris Benoit, making him tap out in a match and asking edge and Christian, if you tap out when the referee isn't there, does that really count as a tap out? It's kind of like if a tree falls in the forest, but no one's there to hear it, does it make any noise? And just seeing Edge and Christian back in that in that old character and Kurt with hair. It's the other thing in this show that was kind of interesting. Big show with hair, Kurt with hair, rock with hair. Um, everybody was so young. It was that kind of blew me away a little bit. Well, Eddie Guerrero here is going to pin test to win the European title eight minutes and 30 seconds. Perry Saturn comes out with Guerrero and, uh, interesting look here to say the least huge size difference between these two guys. They get managed to get two and a quarter stars out. Uh, Malenko comes out, distracts the ref while Guerrero gets the title belt hits test with it, gets the pin. Uh, I thought it was okay. I mean, better than probably you expected a test match to be, but it does feel like, you know, if you could do it over again, you'd do something different with Eddie here. What'd you think? Well, it was the best te test match he ever had. And every time that I watch what Eddie, it just reminds me of how fucking good he really was because Eddie got everything that he could out of test. And there was a size differential, but Eddie made you believe throughout that entire match that he belonged in it and that he could beat this big bastard anytime he wanted. It was, it was what it was, but it was the best match. I think test has ever had in his life. And Perry Saturn with his Hulk Hogan mustache and hat was interesting to say the least at first. I, at first I didn't even know who the hell it was when he came down. Yeah, it is a little weird. Uh, but it's cool to see Eddie here on a WrestleMania. Let's get to the, uh, the next match. And this is probably uh, one of the matches that people remember the most. It gets four and a quarter stars to the all time greats, Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit. They're given 14 minutes and two seconds. Uh, Angle is doing his best to insult this Texas crowd to make sure Benoit is clearly the baby face. Um, I thought the match was really, really good. And I do think maybe, um, 
the ref bump was unnecessary. You know, if we're trying to be critical of something that was already pretty good, uh, what'd you think of the match here? I thought it was excellent. Uh, they told a great story all the way through the damn thing. And it, the story building up to it was well told as well. Benoit and angle had tremendous chemistry and they knew how, even if they would start off slow in a match, they would have the audience by the end and for the finish. So the psychology in, in, in their matches always, always got the audience and it made people believe. And, and if you weren't a believer, you watch that match, you sure as fuck were a believer at the end of the match. And it was just a great told story. Everybody did good, uh, coming out of that. But the, you, you go right from that to what Brian Gewertz would probably say was the highlight of the show, um, was something that he had wanted to do <laughs> so bad and we did it and watching it back. I just, I, I laughed out loud when you go back and you see Kamala standing on William Regal's desk, uh, just slapping his belly and Regal coming in to see that and Kim Chi and, and everybody there just, it was, it was a fun classic little break to get to the interview in the back with, uh, with angle and Benoit attacking angle and to make angle tap out as he said he would. And he made him tap out on the interview set. So it was that story continuing and let you know, this ain't over yet folks. I really enjoy the, um, the finish, you know, where angle goes for the moonsault, Benoit gets the knees up, but it nails angle in the face. And then Benoit uses the diving headbutt, but none of that is what matters. You uh, get a pin out of nowhere using the tights. Uh, after a match like this, this hard hitting, um, any injuries to speak of? Because some of this stuff looked, uh, pretty snug. An injury to the cyborg. No, uh, <laughs> Kurt's Kurt's kind of hard to injure. I mean, he, he can get injured and yes, he has been, but. During this time, he was a machine, and you could smash him in the face with a bulldozer, and he would just keep going. So he was an animal. This is both of their second WrestleMania. Of course, they both were at WrestleMania 2000, and they were in a three-way against Chris Jericho, and now they're back here in a singles match. Uh, what do you think, and how would you compare the two? Um, I know you normally don't like three-ways. Jericho obviously added something different to the match. But it is, you know, basically the same match with or without Jericho. How would you compare and contrast them? And did this match make an impression on Vince? Because it does feel like both of these guys are going to start to get a pretty major push coming out of this. Yes, to, to both of those. And I think that this match was better because it was a single match. And it just amplified the skills of both guys and how well they work together and the believability of every single thing that they did in the ring. So to, to that, it made people notice and see that in this, on this platform and exposure to this many people, they took it and they ran with it and made the very most of it. This is a public service announcement. Manscaped now has beard products and a brand new nose and ear hair trimmer. If you haven't already heard, the leaders in below the waist grooming are traveling north of your South Pole with their revolutionary Beard Hedger Pro Kit. They've now launched the brand new Weed Whacker 2.0, which confirms they have all the best tools for your hygiene toolbox. It's time for you to upgrade your toolbox by going to manscaped.com and using the code STW for 20% off plus free shipping. Gentlemen, meet the Beard Hedger Pro Kit. It's the ultimate package that makes it easier than ever before to craft your signature look. It all starts with the Beard Hedger. This thing is an elite beard trimmer. The Beard Hedger is tough on hair, but smooth on your face, leading to single stroke efficiency that brings satisfaction one stroke at a time. It's a waterproof cordless trimmer with a rotary wheel that has 20 different hair cutting lengths, all with just one guard. So no more messy drawers full of extra add-ons. 
The Pro Kit also comes with a whole bunch of formulations for your post trim care. We've got the Beard Shampoo and Conditioner exclusively from Manscaped. We've also got their Beard Oil, their Beard Balm, and how about three free gifts? That's right, a brush, a comb, and scissors. With a nice beard, your face is perfectly groomed, right? Nope, you need that brand new Weed Whacker 2.0. It offers improved blades and skin safe technology with no tugging guarantee. It's never been so painless to mind your manholes. And now that you've got that face looking great, let's check out the full body grooming experience. The good news is the package 4.0, the performance package 4.0 comes with the Weed Whacker 2.0 and all of the below the waist grooming products that Manscaped is known for. Your significant other will be delighted to see you covering all the bases, if you know what I mean. So get 20% off and free shipping with our code STW at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. And be sure to use our code STW. Always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Well, it was a great match. Go out of your way to watch it, especially if you haven't seen it in a long time. Probably ahead of its time. Uh, I think a lot of guys who we see on the main roster today would probably look at a match like this as inspiration. But... Maybe the next match, not so much. China wins the women's title from Ivory in two minutes and 39 seconds. Uh, the commentary would be China has dropped a lot of weight, slimming down, but also dropping a lot of muscle mass to try and give her a more mainstream look. Match was terrible because it was a total ego show. China blew off the injury angle. Ivory hit her with a belt shot at the bell, but she made a quick comeback and it was a one-sided squash. China gave her a power bomb and then lifted her up at two. Then gave her a press slam and pinned her just by laying backwards. Like it was a piece of cake showing no respect at all. Negative one star. what do you think of China's look here and the commentary on it? And more importantly, the match and the criticism that it was really, uh, disrespectful and uh, squash match. I don't think it was disrespectful at all. It was a squash match and it was meant to be a squash match. It was booked to be that way. As far as China's look, she looked a lot softer. And when I say softer, her overall look, uh, she looked, I guess, more feminine. But uh, it was probably, in my opinion, her best look. And her coming out of this time, it was like, all right. She looked more feminine. And it was meant to be a squash match. It was meant for her to go out and destroy Ivory. And to be the new women's champion. That's what it was designed to do. And that's exactly what it did. Oh my goodness. Next up, we've got a, uh, a baseball segment here. A couple of Astros are interviewed at ringside and, uh, Bagwell says something like wrestlers are great actors. What the fuck did Vince think of that line? God, that's, you know, that's why I hate putting a live microphone in front of douchebags. So, so for all my Houston Astros fans out there, fuck Bagwell. Bagwell is an asshole. Well, let's hear about the Bagwell heat. And for once, we're not talking about no, the buff Houston Bagwell people heat. know Bagwell's a douchebag. We're not talking about buff. We're talking about Jeff. Yeah. Jeff Bagwell's an, is an asshole. Yes. Okay. Good to know. Speaking of assholes, Shane McMahon pinned Vince McMahon in a street fight in 14 minutes and 12 seconds. Uh, Shane, of course, comes out and points out the WCW talent in the building before the match. And then Stephanie comes out with Vince and slaps Shane and Shane gets a kendo stick and starts hitting his father. And, uh, eventually Vince potato Shane to the point that he starts to get a mouse around his eye. And the commentary would be Vince isn't a well-trained worker physically and that his stuff looks bad, but he knows how to play a crowd and is willing to get hit. Of course, the big spot was Shane coming off the top rope through the Spanish announcer's table when Vince was pulled from safety or pulled to safety by Stephanie. And then of course, Trish wheels out Linda for the big spot. Trish slaps Vince and then, uh, Stephanie and Trish brawl to the back. Linda through all of this supposedly doped up. Vince calls her a bitch and pulls her out of the wheelchair, puts her in a chair in the corner, keeps verbally abusing her. Eventually though, you know what happens? Uh, referee Mick Foley stops him from abusing Linda. And then Vince grabs a garbage can to hit Shane. And then Linda just stands up, gives Vince a low blow. 
and Shane puts the garbage can in front of his face and does the van terminator all the way across the ring into the face for the pin. It gets three stars and this comatose Linda thing is finally paid off. Trish finally got her comeuppance. Vince McMahon got hit in the balls and Shane got to jump off shit and then kick a trash can into his dad's head. This is the McMahon family in a match. Is it not? Yeah, it was. It was a culmination of, of a story long, you know, long arcing story, you know, getting to this big blow off, um, watching it back. I literally got goosebumps when Linda stood up and Shane did the point to turn around dad. And Linda got the shot in on Vince, kicking him in the nuts. And, and then we went home from there. It was it was an uncomfortable story leading into it and getting into it. And when you're in that creative process, this is the other thing people don't understand sometimes is they're playing characters on TV, but the characters they're playing on TV are based on, you know, real life human beings. Uh, the names aren't changed or anything. Yes. They're characters and they're, uh, embellished quite a bit to be that evil character. But still, sometimes it can be uncomfortable when you're going through a lot of the machinations and suggestions for some of these things. You have to remove yourself and only look at the character. And that's that's one thing that Vince has been able to do where when it's on the you know on the air where he'll go, okay, you know this is a character and what would that character do? what would what would they do in this situation? And the match was highly entertaining. They beat the living shit out of each other and the payoff was the right one. And it got a huge, huge pop from everybody there. So, um, in my opinion, it was one of the high, high spots of the, of the night. I don't think that we can overstate how fucking loud this crowd got when Linda just stood up. I know. I mean, it really is unbelievable, you know, in this, era where everybody's doing one more majestic, crazy high risk spot after another. I mean, they're awesome. I'm not arguing that at all, but these guys managed to get over standing up. It's unbelievable that that was as over as it was and, and tells you how invested the crowd was in that story. So even though, uh, you know, I'm the world's worst at being critical of all the McMahon storylines, this one had a big payoff. All right, here we go. The match that everybody really remembers from this show and probably one of the most iconic matches in history. No, no, no. The gimmick battle Royal is not yet Conrad. Fuck off. Edge and Christian regain the world tag team titles in a three-way tables, ladders, and chairs. Oh my match over the Dudleys and the Hardy boys. I don't even know that words can describe this. It got four and three quarters. Fuck that. It was five stars. I've never seen anything like this before. Even my, my casual lapsed fans in my life, people who aren't, you know, people who watch regularly or even could name 10 wrestlers today. They remember this match. This is something else. And if you haven't seen it in a long time, or maybe you've never seen it, get out from under your rock and go watch it this week. It's just crazy. The bumps that these guys take, we can't possibly describe it. I mean, the spear from that edge oh. did on the ladder is it was a highlight spot in the open and every sort of video package I don't know, for a decade, maybe longer, but then just falling as far as they did through the tables with Jeff Hardy and, you know, Bubba just crashing into the out, just so many crazy over the top. How are they doing this? How is no one dead? A lot of people still are, uh, wearing the scars and injuries on their body to this day from this, but man, it stands the test of time. Unbelievable. I can't put it over enough. It's your turn in my, in my notes. I actually wrote no words. Yeah. It, it, you sit there and watch this in awe at the athleticism, the, the danger, the skill, but the, the match still made sense as, as crazy as all that is. And they put their bodies through so much punishment. It was unbelievable. And 
at the end of it, for them to get up and walk away from that was a miracle in and of itself. But, you know, like you say, the, the edge spear off the ladder with Jeff Hardy hanging on to the rung in the middle of the ring, hanging from it, trying to grab the belts and, and edge jumping from one ladder to the middle of the ring to spear Jeff Hardy. Insane. The, the, the four table bump on the outside with, like I said, Bubba going through it. Um, every single person in that match came to steal the show that in my opinion that was their goal to go out there that night steal the show and have everybody talking about them and i think that they accomplished it uh phenomenal match just phenomenal story with so many false false finishes back and forth um Hardy's Dudley's edge and Christian just off the chart. Kudos. It's, it's something, I mean, I don't even know how to describe this. You, you were there live. Were you on headsets for the show? Where were you watching this show? Oh my God, man. I'm warming up for my big match. Oh, I don't have time for this shit. I got to get ready to, I had a gigantic battle Royal that I was entered in Conrad with prize money and undisclosed, undisclosed prize money. That trust me was worth fighting for, Pally. What's the reaction backstage to these guys laying it all in the line in this TLC? Seriously, just it was standing ovation and and thankful that they were all able to to walk out because those are scary, man. I don't care who you are, how well trained you are, how tough you are. Those bumps, every single bump was putting their career on the line in so many ways. And they wanted to, they wanted to make it that special. And they did, they definitely delivered. It's unbelievable. Go out of your way to watch it. <sighs> Next up, maybe not the same. I got a dud, but it was fun for what it was. It was a, a dud three minutes, five seconds, a very short old timers battle Royal that we're calling the gimmick battle Royal. All the intros are pretty campy. Commentary is two of the greatest of all time. Mean Gene Okerlund, Bobby the Brain Heenan. And uh, originally, Gilberg, this is according to the rumor and innuendo, was supposed to be in this battle royal, but he's pulled from the show because they're concerned a Goldberg chant may come out, and they didn't really want that yet, especially on the heels of them purchasing WCW. Do you remember that? Did you guys no, pull? I don't. The only one that I, that I remember uh, that we asked to be in it that did not want to be in it was the red rooster. Other than that, I think everybody was, and, and I, I don't remember Gilbert ever being in it. He may have been, I, I just don't remember. Let's keep it rolling here. The guys who are in it are the bushwhackers, Duke, the dumpster, Drose, earthquake, a goon, doink, the clown who played doink here, Ray Apollo, Kamala, kimchi, repo man, Jim Cornette, Nikolai Volkoff. The free bird, Michael Hayes, one man gang who, uh, it would be written here came as gang because, uh, he had lost too much weight to wear the Akeem outfit. It didn't fit anymore. Gobbledygooker, tugboat, hillbilly Jim, brother love and Sergeant slaughter. Um, and it, the biggest pop of the night on entrances was probably Michael Hayes. That's what I was going to say. Uh, Quote, a lot of the wrestlers got no reaction, which isn't a surprise because many of them in their heyday also got no reaction. He's shitting on guys. Bushwhackers as cult favorites, Hayes, who was big in Texas, Love, who's from Houston, and Jim Cornette, more because of having catchy entrance music, all got nice reactions. Of course, once the bell rings, everybody's uh, bailing out like it's the fucking Titanic, except for the Iron Sheik. The Iron Sheik wins three minutes and five seconds. What do you remember about how this came to be? Whose idea was it? Who else did you pitch? Uh, any, any sort of feedback you can give us about this? Cause we get questions about it all the time. Well, it, it was a, it was an idea of trying to incorporate some of the, the past gimmicks and how could we incorporate it? Somebody came up with the idea. Uh, it may have actually been Brian who came up with the idea of let's put them all in a match. And the working name was a gimmick battle Royal. So 
that became the fucking name of it. The gimmick battle Royal with all the, the gimmicky gimmicks from the past. So we started reaching out to guys. I was, I was not reached out to, I was told I was going to be in it and didn't really want to. But then after a while I was like, yeah, hell yeah, this could be fun. Uh, and like I said, the only one that I remember, and there may have been more, but I remember Red Rooster was invited to uh, be a part of it, and he didn't want to be a part of it. So that was uh, the only one I really remember not. But these are guys just going back and looking at old-timers that could still walk. So Sheik was questionable. <laughs> but uh, guys that would still be able to take a bump over the top rope. And again, probably the reason Sheik won is because he wasn't going to be able to take a bump over the top rope. And it just became a fun little project to go out and do and getting everybody together. I think that the guys that were a part of it were just so happy to be there and to be on the show and be a part of it that it was pretty easy to, to lay out. And, you know, Pat Patterson got with everybody and, laid the thing out fairly simply and we went out and had us an old fashioned battle Royal, which I should have won. I felt, you know, being in my hometown, I probably should have gone over. Oh, Jesus. Well, if it were a shoot, I am a three time black belt hall of famer. Well, if Cornette had a baseball. All right. So undertaker, he had a fucking tennis racket. He'd have whooped your ass with it. Yeah, well, that's why I lasted damn near till the end. Next up, Undertaker and Triple H, which almost sounds like a match from this year's WrestleMania. It still happened back in 2001. I uh, think 18 minutes and 17 seconds. Pretty cool entrance for Triple H. Motorhead displayed him to the ring. Of course, Meltzer really, really, really bearing Lemmy here, saying he doesn't even know his own words to his song, but. What the fuck? Bullshit. He was fucking great. I thought it was a great entrance. Really, really enjoyed it. Uh, There is a notable thing that happened in this match, though. Uh, Years later, Triple H has said this is the only time he used a fake sledgehammer. And the fake one winds up hurting the Undertaker, which is kind of ironic. And uh, there is a a weird spot here where you guys are doing a big bump from like a um, a camera platform. Is that the right word? Or what, what do you guys call that? It was from, it was from the tech, pa- uh, from the tech platform and the hard camera section. So they do this big bump over the top and they show a replay in an angle where you can sort of see that it's gimmicked. I mean, you see the, as you would say, the magic, any heat on the director or the cameraman, or, I mean, that's, that's clearly not something Vince wants airing. No. And it, and it was, it was a poorly timed and poorly, uh, chosen shot. But it was the way that it was all laid out originally. No, they weren't supposed to take that shot and they got caught. So it was, it was what it was, but I don't think it took away from the match. The match itself was, was a good match. It told a good story. Um, the, uh, you know, again, it was much like the hardcore match earlier in the night. I'm not a big fan of things taking place not in the ring or where the majority of the audience can see it you're right um oh and and maybe that's because i'm i'm a live event guy and that i always think of the the fan in the arena and if they can't see it to react to it now for television purposes you can cover it nine ways from sunday um sometimes too but too good but for me i'm just not a big fan of that unless it's, it's in a place where everybody can see it. And this was the attempt was to get it up there where everybody could see it on the hard camera platform, but still in that, in that setup, there's still a large percentage of the crowd that can't see it live. And you're looking at screens and everything. I think that just takes away a little bit of it, but the story was told and I thought they had a, had a hell of a match. And it was, you know, a, a tough position to be in to have to follow that gimmick battle Royal. Um, but you know, they did all right here. The, uh, I do want to talk about that, that weird spot a little bit because Meltzer covered it. 
They brawl into this camera pit and Undertaker choke slam Triple H over the pit onto this gimmick gymnastics pit. This was so stupid because the camera just showed this unbelievable side of Triple H going over this railing, disappearing into thin air. As Ross talked about a big drop on the concrete, and they showed more replays of the same thing. Then they killed it with the final replay. Actually showing his landing onto a gimmicked foam rubber pit, which basically turned the match from serious comedy or from serious to comedy and making Ross look bad at trying to sell it as devastating. Then Undertaker, like a young kid at a jungle gym, did an elbow drop into the pit, making it even sillier since you could see the foam protect his fall. Even sillier, the EMTs came out for Triple H and Undertaker attacked him. By the time they got back in the ring, it was nearly 14 minutes into the match. And uh, Undertaker gets the sledgehammer, Tease is using it. Triple H does the low blow. They trode punches. Uh, Undertaker uses the tombstone, no ref. So he sets up the uh, last rod power bomb. Triple H hits him with the sledgehammer and potatoes him, busting him up. And then Undertaker quickly comes back and wins with a last rod power bomb. Three and a half stars. And that spot that busted open Undertaker is with a gimmick sledgehammer. That's amazing to me that of all the times it was the real one, everybody, I guess, knew to be safe. And maybe they just thought we can throw caution in the wind since it's gimmicked. And that's the one that fucking hurts him. Well, the only part about it was gimmicked is the head, the, 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 the wood and all that shit. Everything else about it is real. So God he, damn, I really wish blue Chew was a sponsor this week. No shit. Fucking nailed it. And I, I can't I even say it. Bastards. I know. All right. But it, it was, it was just kind of, it was one of those freak accidents that, that happens sometimes. And, and the, and of course, as usual, Meltzer's wrong because you couldn't tell it was a crash pad until undertaker did the uh, elbow drop and they took the shot of the impact. That was the only time you could really tell that it was. And then after that, nothing else mattered, you know, because then it was blatant, but the initial, the initial bump and the initial shots, you, you couldn't really tell until, they followed Undertaker all the way down and went, oh, fuck. So, Dude, is what it is. Shit happens sometimes. That tickled me. The head was gimmicked, but the wood was real. All right. Let's <laughs> 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 well, sometimes. Well, I'm not. Uh, all anyway. right. Next up, the longest main event ever. Steve Austin wins the WWF title from The Rock, 28 minutes and six seconds. Hot pace early, Meltzer would say. The vast majority of the crowd cheered Austin. Couldn't hear any boos for Austin, even when he did the full-fledged turn. Uh, this is, um, you know, it's weird because Rock hits a stunner for a near fall, and Vince comes out, and then Austin hits Rock's spine buster for a near fall, and Rock comes back with a spine buster in people's elbow, and then McMahon breaks up the pin with a save. And then rock goes after Vince, but Austin gives him, uh, the, the, uh, rock bottom and Austin uses a low blow and he holds rock for McMahon to hit him with a chair. And even at this point, the crowd is refusing to turn on Austin, even though the belief going into this had to be that the hate on the McMahon character is so strong, especially this night, given what we just saw with Linda, that this will surely turn Austin. But it doesn't to the live crowd. They go back and forth. And then eventually Austin just goes berserk and hits the rock, you know, 15, 20 times all over his body and then scores the pin. And then Austin and McMahon shake hands and drink beer. And that's the end. It got four and a half stars in the observer. And here comes the hate. I fucking hated it. I hate the finish. I think it ruined it. I love the hype for this. I love the build for it. The promos they're doing ahead of time, the video, it's all outstanding. But when Vince came out to me, the whole thing took a shit. Your turn. I loved it. I loved it. And it was, it had to be the first step to get where we were trying to go with Austin misstep hindsight being 2020, but at the time it was, you had to do it. You had to get there on the biggest stage of them all to set the stage for the rest of the summer and where we wanted to go. Um, looking, you know, when you look back on it, that Texas crowd and the more Steve was a heel, the more people loved him. 
That's what made Steve a babyface. His heel tendencies, everything that he did was heelish. So we were trying to do something different, uh, but I still don't think it took away from the match. And I think that the match overall was excellent and told you that, that story. Because if you remember going into it, Austin's promos were, I will do, I have to win and I will do whatever it takes to get that title back. And that was the underlying premise leading up to it, that Steve was desperate and willing to do whatever it takes to win that championship back. And that meant he made a deal with the devil and he was willing to do whatever it took. And if that meant getting in cahoots with Mr. McMahon, then he would even do that to get the championship. So that story I thought was told really well. When you look at it in totality leading up to it, um, Steve was just, man, Stone Cold Steve Haas was so fucking over that no matter what you did or to who, they were going to love, they were going to love it because it was Stone Cold Steve Austin. And I don't know what, you know, what you could do to change that. Uh, we, we tried a lot of different things and he's one of those characters that is genuine, that they feel that whatever guy you have out there, that's him. There's nothing put on. And I believe in that guy. So if he's doing it, then it must be right. In your opinion, would this have worked better? I'm not going to say worked. Would it have worked better if they weren't in Texas when they tried to turn Steve? That's a tough one. I, it probably would have worked better somewhere else. Like for example, in, in, if you had done, if you had done that same thing in Toronto, let's let's flip flop, let's flip flop. Let's put them in Montreal and then let's, let's put 17 in Montreal and then let's put 18 here in Houston. If, if this was in Montreal, it would have been easier to turn him. Right. I think so. Yes. Do you think the size of the building hurts it too? And what I mean is, you know, I I know that Austin always talks about how much he enjoyed wrestling in Chicago because at the Rosemont horizon or all state arena. Now it's got those wood ceilings. So the sound sort of reverberates down and it gets really, really loud in there. Whereas here in a big dome, maybe there is a bit of a delay. The sound isn't exactly the same. It escapes up a little more, which is what we hear about for big stadium shows outdoors. Do you think being so far away, people already sort of have a preconceived, they've been preconditioned. Hey, Austin's the good guy. And so the little nuances maybe don't resonate the same. Does that make sense? I don't know if the building is different for the audience. It's definitely different for the performers sometimes. Uh, but this was a hometown crowd, man. They, they came to see their guy. Plus Steve was the challenger. They wanted their guy to win. They wanted to see a title change and they were behind him a hundred percent. So it's, yeah, I think if it were to be held, as you say in Montreal or even Toronto or something like that, I think that they would have been uh, a lot more receptive to booing Mr. McMahon and the Alliance with Steve. I think they would have gone, what the hell? Um, but I don't know. Steve's Steve's character was one of those that no matter what he did, they still got behind him. He was a tough one to turn heel. In hindsight, you know, Austin has said that he had, you know, really basically two regrets in his run with the WWF. Well, the major ones were walking out in 02, but then turning heel here. And I think I mean, I think he's right. Do you think when you look back hindsight being what it is, what would you have done differently? Um, not had the baby face match. Um, and what, what I mean by that is I would have had him wrestle somebody else. Well, no, not wrestle somebody else. I'm saying that I would have had rock go in as a stone cold heel, uh, pardon the pun or turn Steve ahead of it. And done something different with Steve 
before you got there, just so that the audience had a definitive good guy and a bad guy here. They were split and, and you watch the match, man, they were cheering for rock just as much as they were steer, cheering for Steve, Steve, Steve Moore, but there were pops for rock man. And, and they were behind him on the spots. The false finishes were all there. Uh, but if you had turned, if you want, we're dead set on going with Steve. If we turned him at the Royal rumble and done some dastardly things getting to that point. But even then, if he was the challenger, eh, I don't know how, how that's going to feel. However, if rock as the champion were a heel going into it, you'd have blown the roof off the place. And you, they blew the roof off the place anyway. When Steve won business starts to take a little bit of a dip and I got to think that a portion of the audience, when stone cold became a bad guy lost interest. And I know that, you know, Michael Hayes used to say, you know, when you get hot, that's when you leave <laughs> the idea being, you want to always be able to come back. And that, that's a more territorial way of thinking where, you know, you never want to stay until you're just not a draw anymore. That way you can always, you got somewhere to come back to, but here, do you think he left money on the table? And do you think Steve thinks he left money on the table by turning heel here? Yes. Yeah, I do. Because I think that Steve winning the title rock going away, um, it's almost don't fix what's not broken, but we wanted to do something new. And we wanted to try something. And Steve was adamant going into it about wanting to be a heel. And we all, you know, we all bought into it. But again, when you look back with, and you look back, rose colored glasses, 2020 vision. mm, Don't know if we'd make that same decision. All right. Let's talk about it. A lot of people say this is the best WrestleMania ever. I'm saying, eh, eh. You say, I say it is, I, just I say from my, from my experience and, and going back, um, you know, there's, there's WrestleMania three, and then there's this one. It's, and to me, this finish messes it up for me. I can't, I can't enjoy it the same way. I wish I could. I mean, I remember where I watched this one. I remember exactly where I was, who I was with, what I was doing. It's a memorable show, but the main event, it's just like, oh man, it's not what I was hoping for. And that's fair. I mean, that, that's fair looking at it, you know, from a fan point of view. I, I can definitely see that sentiment. Um, looking at it as an attraction and looking at it as far as the quality of the matches up and down overall. Were they all 42 stars or whatever in Tokyo Dome? No, but it was a good, it had a great start, great middle, and a great finish. So uh, to me, I think it delivered an for me of the WrestleMania as I was involved in is the best. What do you, um, what do you think about this, you know, box of gimmicks battle Royal for lack of a better word? you think y'all will ever do that again? I don't know. Uh, I thought it was fun. It, it could happen. It could definitely happen. Uh, I don't know who those, the gimmicks have been toned down since 2000s and the the only gimmicks that are left are even older than the ones <laughs> that were in that one so it's scary let me think i think i might have been the youngest person in the ring i mean that's scary duke dressa is older than you okay duke maybe the goon is older than you. Yeah. Yeah. Barney's older than me. Duke is uh, only 50. So yeah, you're way older than him. All right. So let's talk about why Not this way. Was such a big show. The figure 67,925 fans would rank seventh on the all time recorded list at that point. Obviously the, uh, the North Korea shows were gigantic. WrestleMania three was bigger. SummerSlam at Wembley was bigger. It was a Tokyo Dome show in 98, uh, that show in Toronto in 86 with, uh, Paul Orndorff and Hulk Hogan. Um, WrestleMania six was another big one. I think that was like, uh, 67, 678. And so you barely beat that one here, but 
of course, everybody argues about attendance. We'll move along. The paid attendance is 62,886, which is gigantic and trails only WrestleMania three, as far as highest number of paid attendees for a wrestling show in North America. So just tremendous attendance and the gate translates as well. It's $3,530,905, which is the largest in history outside of Japan. I mean, just unbelievable. Really the WWF record, uh, at the, uh, WrestleMania six Hogan warrior in Toronto was 3.49 us. So you beat that one too. Uh, WrestleMania five was only 1.6. And I think most people remember WrestleMania five set a lot of records with Hogan and Savage on top. The merchandise though, is one of the real stories. It set a record that doubled the company record and the North American record. $540,000 worth of swag was sold at WrestleMania three. They did 1.1 million here. So nearly double. It's unbelievable when you really think about how much merch that is. Uh, the per head figure for this show is $17 and 67 cents, which is the second highest figure average per head, uh, since the last WrestleMania in Anaheim, which was WrestleMania 2000, the all time record for WrestleMania pay-per-view buys was in 2000, 824,000 buys, but they're going to beat that here too. I can't believe this is a real thing. But you guys go from 800,000 some odd buys for the first time ever, you break a million, you do a million 40,000 buys, uh, a record. You know, we talk about WrestleMania five being, you know, the, the former benchmark that was 767 WrestleMania 15 was 800,000 WrestleMania 2000 was 824 WrestleMania X seven is a million 40,000. You wouldn't break that again until WrestleMania 21, which is just fucking bananas that you were able to get that many buys. And as a result, it sets a revenue record. I mean, even when Meltzer is trying to predict what the gate would be, I mean, what the total take would be, he ran the scenario at 800,000 buys. And again, it did over a million, but at 800,000 buys, he guessed the gross would be $36.6 million. And that's with only 800,000 buys. There's another 200,000 that he didn't even throw in the estimate here. Is that right? Is this the biggest WrestleMania ever by a huge margin? Yeah, as far as drawing goes. And it was also the first time that we really were able to calculate all of the impact that we had, much like you, you read about the economic impact that Super Bowl and NBA bring into a town with their specials. That's what we were doing at this point. We were looking at, we would spend a week there. Well, how much impact did we have on the restaurants and on every, hotels and everything in the city? So when you look at all that, then you look at the revenue brought in from that because we had access and all these different events taking place the week of that it was probably the most profitable WrestleMania in history at that point. Uh, without question. And, uh, the fans loved it just as much as you did. According to the wrestling observer reader poll, it got 99% thumbs up 1% thumbs down the best match. It was a runaway in the reader poll. It was Austin rock. Second place was the TLC match. Third was angle and Benoit. The worst match, and it was a runaway, was China and Ivory. Do you agree with the way that ranks? You would put Austin Rock 1, TLC 2, and then Angle Benoit 3? Yes, actually I would. Uh, and I think uh, there's an argument for the TLC match to be number 1. That's me. I'd go that way. And I'd put Angle Benoit number 2 and Austin Rock 3 just because of the finish. Yeah, no, I, I do agree with the with the way it shook out. But uh, I would say Austin Rock and the TLC match are almost tied. Well, I tell you what, you don't want to be tied when you're playing 2k. So we want to tell you that this week's episode of something to wrestle is brought to you by the WWE Supercard season five, this collectible card battle game enjoyed by millions and millions of WWE fans featuring your favorite superstars. 
We're talking the big names, The Rock, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Ronda Rousey. And season five of WWE Supercard is available now for free in the Apple App Store, Google Play, and Amazon's App Store. Check it out right now. Go visit WWE.2K.com forward slash wrestle to get your free card pack. That's WWE.2K.com forward slash wrestle, and you're going to get a free card pack. And while we're doing cards, we should send a very special happy birthday to the one and only Michael PS Hayes. Today is a big monumental birthday for that man. He turned 60 years old today. How about that? Do, do, do. Do you want to, uh, have Jim Cornette or Dusty Rhodes or Macho Man or Johnny Ace or Vince McMahon sing him happy birthday? Fuck that goddamn old free bird motherfucker. Happy birthday, bitch. Well, all right, there you go. Uh, if you'd like to, and, and you should, by God, uh, you should send a happy birthday message to our buddy. He's been a big part of the show, and uh, he's never appeared on the show because we don't do guests. But he did do a run-in at a live show. He's at Michael P.S. Hayes and the number one. At Michael P.S. Hayes one. Today is his 60th birthday. And originally, we were going to cover him today. Uh, but you guys were hot and heavy on WrestleMania X7. So here we are. Uh, let's get to some questions here. We did some rapid fire questions on social media. I'm going to run through these. Bruce, are you ready? I am ready. Um, why was so much TV time put into the rock Deborah manager connection? It seems something big was happening, but I never got why was there a reason for this? And why was it dropped so quickly? That comes to us from Sean Blackford. I don't think anybody cared. And when we got into it, it was a way to try and, and put a further wedge in between them, them being rock and Austin, but I don't think anybody really cared. And it, it was a force more than anything. CJ Newman wants to know, did William Regal get any grief for wearing the intercontinental title upside down on the way to the ring? He wore it upside down that bastard. I don't think anybody noticed. All right. Uh, Marcelo de Casas wrote, there are a bunch of great matches on this show. My question is which match does Bruce believe doesn't get the credit it deserves. Hmm. Probably, I, I guess from listening to you, the Austin rock match, but I think it does get the credit it deserves and probably the regal Jericho match because it set the pace and it set the tone for the night and it, it got off to a great start and may not get the love that it really deserves. It was good. Let's talk a little bit about Fuber's question. He wants to know, did Linda need to practice kicking Vince in the balls? Now that sounds like a silly question, but at the same time, if you've never, you know, tried to work a kick to the balls, that means you just really kick him in the balls. What happened? Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. No, it, it, it's here's the thing with someone that, that is not a seasoned worker, you just got to take it. And for her to try and practice that and pull that, it would look terrible. Here's a rumor. I never heard. This one comes to us from Scott. I heard rumor years ago that triple H and Mike Tyson were considered for this show. How close was that to happening? I never heard that. What? Yeah. Apparently this guy thinks Mike Tyson was going to wrestle triple H. Is that just made up? Um, Never heard that until just this moment ever. Uh, Steven wants to know why was the gobbledygooker in a different outfit than the original one? Did the company not keep that one? Feels like that would have been in mint condition. No, fuck. He tore it all over the place after survivor series and the old costume, had disappeared and was in really, really bad shape. Well, it didn't disappear. It was in really, really bad shape. I don't know why that's funny to me, but it is. Uh, Norm wants to know, what does Bruce think of the stage on camera shots? You couldn't really see the WrestleMania X seven fully, but the disappointed with the look of the show. <laughs> um, that was a day of altercation because the original set, the way that it went up with, to get all of that in blocked a shitload of seats and the Astrodome was legitimately 100% sold out. And then on top of that, you had a lot of extras with people coming into suites and, and just different areas. So to try and accommodate another, I think it was almost 3000 people, 
that would have been affected if that had gone all the way to the roof, like it was designed. Um, it would have been a, it was a tragedy and it was tough enough to do what we had to do to move people that we had to move once it was actually set up. But there was a lot of shuffling going on and it just, it was made bigger than was anticipated. Those tickets were sold. So we had to make concessions. Great question from AJ. Uh, this WrestleMania was branded X seven. The year prior was WrestleMania 2000. The year following was X eight. Was there a deliberate effort to move away from the more traditional Roman numerals during the attitude era? And if so, why change it back to WrestleMania X I X number 19? Uh, a whim, no more Roman numerals. God damn it. We've got to get it. The year 2000. Um, just change for no other reason, uh, just change. And it, back in the day, I remember it would never change from Roman numerals and then it changed and then it changes back. So it may change again in the future. Uh, Ted wants to know, are there any pictures of Bruce working gorilla dressed as brother love? I did not work gorilla this match. Jerry, uh, Jerry Briscoe did. So what'd you do the rest of the day? Dude, I look, I was training, I was Shut warming up. up. Come on. I was I was watching match footage on all of the competitors in in that battle royal because look, Repo Man, he's sneaky. And I knew that yeah. Tune in so next was, week for keeping K something to K Fabe with, Bruce Pritchard. No, that's what seriously, that's what I did. I just was getting ready for the match and, and watching the show. Oh my god. That's so fucking dumb. Why is that dumb? It just is. Hey, I'm not going to go out there and, and blow a quadruplicity. Can you be snippets said chase? David Bixon span writes the week of WrestleMania X seven is when the WWE started branding the female talent exclusively as divas. What led up to that decision? Just a change in presentation and, and how, you know, no different than superstars. The females are going to be divas. It was just a branding. All righty. Uh, downtown Howell Brown wants to know, do you think the promo package for rock Austin is the best that the company ever produced? One of the best ever. Yes. And it was, like I said, I watched it twice and it was just that damn good. And the music fit the music, fit the story. Andrew wants to know, did Bruce enjoy kicking Jim Cornette's ass in the battle Royal? <laughs> Uh, he kicked my ass a little bit too, but we had a, we had an awful lot of fun and corny and I looked at each other and said, I'm coming for you and made sure that we were safe in that corner until he got eliminated quickly. And I immediately went, Oh fuck man. Uh, then mixed it up with, with Michael Hayes and the goon and bushwhackers and old Lakeem a little bit there. But, uh, no, I was a lot of fun and we did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> we'd stay safe in our own corner of the ring. Um, Francis wants to know who came up with the designs for the baseball jerseys for mania. Oh, uh, that'd be art department people. But I think it was, you know, it, I just thought they were cool as shit. I loved them. Uh, and it, it was an art art department deal. I think coming off of the Astros, because Houston had lost their football team by that time, but kind of playing off of the Astros and the Astrodome being a baseball stadium. All right. Uh, Brad wants to know, and this is a great question. Corporal Kirshner was in the first graphic used on television for the gimmick battle Royal. Is there a story or any recollection of why he was booked and then canceled? Or was this just an error on the graphic? Uh, that's, that's, that's a fun question. Cause I didn't even know that that was there, but he even tweets a picture of it here where he's top left next to Sergeant Slaughter. Well, uh, Kirshner was originally, uh, put into the thing. And then later on, I think he had a conflict or didn't want to do it, but he was one on the original list. And it may have been one of those situations where TV had a list of, okay, here's some of the people that will be in it. And Kirshner never got off the list. Um, Andrew wants to know, is there ever any talk or even possibility to keep Bobby Heenan around in a, in a regular or semi-regular way on air after mania? Yeah, I think we all would have loved that. 
And, you know, Bobby, I don't think Bobby was ready to come back in any kind of full-time capacity, but that was opening the door for Bobby to, to come back. Same thing with Gene for both of those guys to come back and be used on a sparing basis in the future. But yes, we, we definitely would have loved to have have, had Heenan back. You talked about one name, hard barbecue, hard movie barbecue wants to know, were there any other names who turned down an appearance in the gimmick battle Royal? Um, again, the only one I really remember was Terry Taylor, the red rooster. Um, and obviously something happened with Kirshner and I don't remember what that was, but I know he was on the original list. Um, but Terry Taylor is the only one that I remember. Cause I just thought, why the hell wouldn't you want to come and do it? Donnie, it's a good payday and go have fun. Donnie wrote something I'd never heard before. There's long been rumors that Bret Hart was going to be the special guest referee for the Vince Shane match with Mick Folt, Mick Foley ultimately filling that role. Did WWE seriously negotiate with Brett to return here? And if so, how close did it come to happening? No, not at that point. No, I don't even think that by that time that we were even talking to Brett. So that didn't happen for another year or two. Mike Siron wants to know what you thought about stealing finishers, rock and Austin trading stunners and uh, rock bottoms here. Well, they weren't stealing it. They were using it against each other. And that was part of the story building up was that, you know, Austin, I'll beat you with the rock bottom and rock coming back. I'll beat you with the stunner. So it was a part of the story leading up to it that they knew each other so well that they were able to use each other's finisher. And, uh, that was just part of the story to make this match unpredictable. Beard of Riker wants to know. Was the name for this WrestleMania sort of like one of the other Vincisms where you can't call it a belt? It's a championship backstage. Do people refer to this show as X seven or they made to, or did everybody just still commonly refer to it as 17? I was 17. Uh, Hans Carpenter says Raven claims he came within millimeters of cutting the building's power. When he crashed the golf court golf cart during the hardcore title match, how would it have been handled if he cut the power to the building? What would have been the protocol and would you've had to offer refunds? Well, uh, no, he didn't come close to killing the power from the building. The power for a building that size is a, it's all over the place. And no, that didn't happen. He came close to damn near electrocuting himself and, and fucking some shit up, but he never would have taken out the power for the whole building. Well, all right. We're going to take out the power on this week's episode. We hope that you enjoyed WrestleMania X seven. And uh, I look forward to your uh, hate tweets. I am at Hey, Hey, it's Conrad. He is at Bruce Pritchard and we are out of time this week on the show, but we look forward to being back with you here next week. And if you haven't already go snatch up a ticket and see myself, Bruce Pritchard. And of course, good old Jr. on stage for the last time in New York city. Tickets are on sale right now at BrucePritchard.com. It's the Monday after WrestleMania. You can still enjoy raw and then come check us out and wrap up your WrestleMania weekend in style and uh, stay tuned in the coming weeks. We've got King Kong Bundy, Michael PS Hayes, and a whole lot more. Give us a follow on Twitter. If you haven't already, and uh, hopefully we'll try to get that video up there for my way with Limp Biscuit and uh, go out of your way to watch that. And that TLC from this show, be glad you did. Man, I just love talking to you guys about chili sleep. I am sleeping better than ever, and I know I'm enjoying a better quality of life, all because I get a good night's sleep. I got to give you guys a peek behind the curtain. A few years ago, pre chili sleep, I was sleeping like five, maybe six, sometimes seven, but very rarely seven hours a night. But that wasn't even continuous sleep. I was fussing with the covers, fighting with the pillows, I was up and down, tossing and turning. I was trying to get comfortable. I had a ceiling fan in my bedroom. I would crank down that AC. I would kick a leg out from underneath the covers. I was doing whatever I could to not be hot because I knew I slept better when I was cool. Well, it turns out I was right. Science tells us the best way to achieve and maintain consistent deep sleep is by lowering our core body temperature. You see, temperature controlled sleep prepares your muscles after a hard day's work and it improves your cognitive function. So you always start your day feeling sharp and alert. Now, Sleep Me is the new home for Chili Sleep. Sleep Me is bringing you the same great sleep that Chili Sleep offered, but under a new name. Chili Sleep makes the coldest and most comfortable sleep systems available. They create the environment that meets your body's natural need 
for lower core temperatures, promoting deep, more restorative sleep. Chili Sleep makes the Uller, the Cube, and the Doc Pro Sleep System. All three are water-based, temperature-controlled mattress toppers. Let me explain. They fit over your existing mattress, and they provide you your ideal sleep temperature. These mattress pads keep your bed at the perfect temperature for deep sleep, cold sleep. You see, Sleep Me is designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and give you the confidence and energy to power through your day. I'm jealous of this. I've got the Uller, but they just launched the brand new Doc Pro Sleep System. I can't wait to try it. It has two times more cold power than their other models. It's whisper quiet, and it has a tubeless mattress pad design that allows for five times more cooling contact. Why not pair it with the new sleep.me app? That's going to give you like uh, think of it as almost like a smart thermostat for your phone. My wife has her side of the bed automated. She wants to climb into a warm bed, but she wants to uh, drop that temperature as she starts to fall asleep. So she doesn't get all hot and sweaty and she gets that deep sleep. But then she has her side of the bed automatically set to warm her up, to wake her up. How about that for sleep scheduling? Head on over to sleep.me forward slash wrestle to learn more and save 25% off the purchase of any new Doc Pro, Cube, or Uller sleep system. This offer is available exclusively for something to wrestle with listeners, and it's only for a limited time, y'all. That's sleep, S L E E P dot M E slash wrestle to take advantage of our exclusive discounts and wake up feeling refreshed every day. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with. Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? Just another day in paradise. By God, Fluffy is a happy duck. Man, I'm so excited to be here with you. I can't believe it. It is WrestleMania season, and here we are talking about one of the biggest WrestleManias of all time. Happened 20 years ago. I can't believe it. Went down March 17th, 2002. The world famous. We're late. Wait a minute. We're late. Is that a surprise to you? Know, okay, stop it. Just shut up. Just shut <laughs> up your face. How's that? Is that better? I'll shut up my face. Yeah, shut up your face. Hey, man, WrestleMania 18. Golly, what an iconic show. It really is a great show, top to bottom. But when people think about this show, man, you hear that phrase all the time. This was a one match show. Not in meaning that there wasn't anything else good on the show, but golly, everything else just paled in comparison. We're still talking about Hogan rock 20 years later, dude. Are we? I think so. Like I, I I'm friends with a, a few of the Bowies and they say, Hey man, that's David the greatest, Bowie? that's the greatest match of all time. Ah, and and, and I, I would say, say ah, I don't know about that. But I think the star of the match, don't get me wrong. What Hogan did was tremendous. What rock did was tremendous, but the what st- I did was the star. Well, I was going to say the crowd, my God. I mean, wouldn't you love to have a crowd like that? Every single Monday, every single Friday, that was like a dream scenario with that crowd response. Was it not? Well, you know, I'll tell you, Toronto has always been one of those markets that you didn't, they didn't disappoint they, they were into everything. And, uh, one of the reasons why I think that WrestleMania was a great, <laughs> it was a great event to hold in Toronto because the, the audience was just so into it. It was like every event they were just so happy to have in their market, in their town. And they showed it in their response every single time. Such a phenomenal event. Uh, we're coming off of no way out 2002. It featured the NWO of Hollywood. Conrad, 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 I got your email. Oh, good. Okay. Now I'm glad to hear it. Got it. Bruce is figuring out technology boys and girls. He's a big boy. It takes a while to come from Abilama up here to, you know, where where things move fast. Don't even act got hung up in Abilama, uh, internet world of the internet. And the Huntsville web. Okay. You know, I'm not going to sit here and let you disparage the good goddamn name of, of, of Abilama, because the reality is, you know, Abilama, you know, this, and I know this big wheels keep on turning. You'd rather live down here and live up there. See my kin singing songs about Southland. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. That's right. Sweet home, Alabama. Do you know any, do you know, uh, can you name five Alabama songs? Like not songs about Alabama, but from the band Alabama. 
Uh, Mountain Mount, Mountain Man, Mountain Music. I'll give you credit for that. Um, well, there's that one. All right, there we go. Um, can you name five songs about from Kansas? Oh yeah, Carry On My Wayward Son, uh, Dust in the Wind. All right, that's all I got. Okay, well, see, that was as uh, you know, and that that was an inside. That was an inside that, inside baseball. That is that super was like inside. not just inside baseball. That was inside inside baseball. Hey, let's talk Why about did that one. some inside baseball. The NWO comes back. No way out. Two thousand two. Before we go any further, we haven't had a chance you and I to catch up here on the show and talk about boy the untimely passing of the bad guy. Razor Ramon, Scott Hall, what an influential character. What a tremendous run he had. I mean, his influence will live on for a long, long time, not just because of Razor Ramon, not just because of the NWO, but the way he helped all the performers around him and man, what an outpouring he's received. Can you share any memories with us or what would you like to share with our audience today? About Scott well, Hall. First of all, my condolences to, to his family. I think that sometimes Scott has been the subject of, you know, negative. I think that sometimes the negative outweighs the good in some people's eyes, but that's not always the case. The negative is just what people want to hear a lot of times and what they dwell on. And what is forgotten in that is the human being behind that character, behind the character that is in the public eye. And Scott Hall was someone that, as you say, the outpouring has been tremendous because when you whittle it all down, Scott Hall, one of the most influential talents in the modern era, but behind the scenes, Scott was one of the boys that took care of the boys. And I'll, I'll give you a story. My brother, was working in Germany for Otto Vons and big Scott Hall. That was his gimmick. Big, big Scott Hall. <laughs> because people also forget how big Scott actually was. Scott was a big man. And Tom was working with this guy by the name of Steve Wright, I believe was his name. Uh, tough, tough guy. And beating the hell out of Tom. They, they did rounds and they like had like team things where they had guys in their corners and they did round matches and Tom's just getting the, his head handed to him goes back in between rounds in the corner. And Scott's like, Hey man, you need to go back in there. Just knock the shit out of this guy. Fuck him. He's going to keep hitting you until you hit him back. Knock him on his ass. Fuck him. He wants to shoot, shoot. Tom went back in in the second round and fired some live rounds back. And all of a sudden, they started working together. And, you know, Scott was that way. Scott had his back, but Scott was there to tell him. And I think you, there's a lot of stories like that of Scott taking, you know, younger talent. People look at the one, two, three kid. Hey, man, the one, two, three kid wouldn't have been made if it wasn't for Scott Hall. He yep. could have had all the matches in the world if he didn't have Scott Hall to put him over the way that Scott Hall did in that story, then, you know, wouldn't have happened. And just in general, it was always one of those faces that you could see backstage that can make you smile. Whether Scott was in a good mood or a bad mood, he made you smile. Because if he was in a good mood, he'd say some smart ass funny thing. And if he was in a bad mood, he would be grumpy and say some smart ass thing that would just make you smile because he was grumpy. So, um, you know, much, uh, much love to Scott Hall. My condolences to the family. We lost, we lost a great one in, in Scott Hall and that, uh, those are just spitting facts by God, but a, a wonderful guy and a wonderful contributor to our business that will never, ever, ever be forgotten. You know, I had a conversation recently with, uh, Jake and DDP, and we were talking about the NWO and Scott Hall and his impact. And, and, and I made the argument and I really do believe this. I don't know the NWO would have worked as well if it started with anyone other than Scott. Like when people talked about Scott in past tense this past week for the first time ever, they used one word more than any other cool. And I think the success of the NWO as a brand, as a t-shirt, as a piece of merch, as an angle, it really centered around being cool. 
And I'm not saying this to be dismissive or ugly or rude, but at the time Hulk Hogan was, well, not exactly that cool, but the association with Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and this new look and an angle and attitude and t-shirt and presentation, it was cool, but it took one guy who was able, who was able to just ooze that machismo and that cool to, to be able to do it. I think if you switched out almost anyone else, it doesn't work as well. The NWO, would you agree with that? I agree that Scott Hall without a doubt was, you know, Scott and Kevin were, were key to that because they just come off of WWE TV and Scott was able to portray that character as right off of our TV and being, being the shit and being as though he represented everything that he had just come from. So yeah, I, I think he was an extraordinary performer. Well, let's jump back into it. We discussed no way out in the archives. Be sure to check that out. Uh, but the raw after no way out and that show in particular is focused on two things, setting up Hogan versus rock and getting triple H his win back over Kurt angle to regain his title shot against Chris Jericho. Now that show goes down in Chicago and Dave Meltzer would write quote for generations of fans in different eras. They all have their moment. Hulk Hogan put on the best mic performance of his career while going back and forth with the rock to set up the main event at WrestleMania. What had at first seemed like a huge match on paper for the biggest show of the year suddenly became a dream match, transcending generations as the two went verbally toe to toe before an entranced crowd in Chicago. Uh, Bruce, these two cutting a promo on each other is probably the best promo battle in the history of the company, at least up to this point. Uh, Meltzer called it a main event early on in the build. Obviously you guys are thinking about, you know, two absolute transcendent stars here being in the ring together. That feels like as the old cliche goes, a main event anywhere in the country, but was there ever consideration going in? Hey, what if rock and Hogan closed the show or did Vince feel, man, the title has to go on last. No, there was never any consideration for this to close the show. It was an excellent attraction and it was one of those once in a lifetime, you know, events that, uh, was going to be a huge moment in WrestleMania, but I don't think that anyone thought that it was going to close. No. When they're in the ring together in Chicago, you could just feel the electricity. I wasn't there. I felt it through the TV screen. They're in the building that day. Is that a goosebump moment? Are you and Vince looking at each other in gorilla? Like, holy shit. What do we got here? I was in the audience. I, I went out, stood in the audience for the entrances. I stood in the audience for the beginning of the match and just literally right in the middle of the audience. And I think I was with Brian, maybe some other folks, but I, I definitely remember looking at Brian going, Do they know who the heel and baby face was supposed to be in this match. They, hey, like yelling at people going, Hey, wrong guy. No, cheer him. You know, and it was, but it was interesting. It was right before your very eyes. And it was a magical, intense moment. Goosebumps all the way, sustained goosebumps all the way, because it was just a feeling of greatness in the air, if you will. Hey folks, it's time to take your podcast game to the next level. And you certainly want to get your almighty push. My God, we have to have a push, right? Well, get that over at adfreeshows.com. Now, I'm telling you, if you're a fan of Grilling JR, adfreeshows.com has the entire episode library. And it's got no ads. Zero ads, zilts, none. Ad free and on video starting at just nine bucks. Did you hear what I, what I said? Nine dollars. You spend more than that at Starbucks, for God's sakes. Two mornings. That's not all, folks. We've got tons of bonus content, including my After Hours Roundtable, where drinking was involved with Eric and Tony. You simply will not find a better value in all of wrestling. Hey, look, don't make me go red ass, because by God, you know I will. Hurry over to adfreeshows.com right now and sign up. And I thank you. I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about this because it does feel super interesting that, you know, 
not too long before this, whether it was a month before or a week before there was a lot of chatter that boy, the, the WWE locker room was sort of looking around like, man, do we really want to bring these guys in? But even when Vince sought the counsel of people who were on the inner circle, there were a lot of folks who said, I don't know about this now to see this response from Hogan and rock. Vince has to feel like, holy shit, this was the right call, right? Look at this. Well, I think that it was the right call for this particular match and, and this particular matchup itself. I, I think that you're kind of mixing two things and that was this match great? Absolutely it was. Was it always the best thing to bring all three of those guys in? Maybe, maybe not. Uh-oh, oh shit. Hey, Conrad, the, what, the train's coming through. <laughs> Oh, are, are you okay? Yeah, that, no, it's just that that morning train comes through or right, right, right behind here. Oh, darn. Each morning. So after the promo battle, well, it gets a little silly. Hall, Nash and Hogan attack rock and send him off in an ambulance. And Bastards. Then, and then of course, Hogan drives a forklift into it. Um, it's not what he did. Oh, it was an 18 wheeler. It was a big rig. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the observer said, yeah. yes, say that was kind of like the here. And you know what? He sounded the horn before. Remember that? <laughs> Can I just tell you that you're gross? Why am I gross? Well, first of all, um, uh, you're in a bathrobe and you've got a punky Brewster haircut today. Bedhead Jones. Okay. I woke up at four o'clock in the morning to do this and you're blowing your nose. Like, uh, you've had a rough night out. No, that's just cause I had boogies in my nose. How do you make a tissue dance? How do you make a tissue dance? I don't know. You put a little boogie in it. And you're dancing over there that, you know, I'm not dancing. This is not a a video. Just a minute ago. You wait one day. We'll have video. All right. So it wasn't needed. This is according to Meltzer. As the mic work had already sold the match better than anything possibly could have done, but maybe it was felt it was needed to do something spectacular for the NWO's first television appearance. That was maybe lacking at the pay-per-view the night before, as well as to try to give raw, maybe more of a less predictable edge. We had first heard of the forklift destroying the ambulance plan about a week back, but it seemed to be geared towards happening at WrestleMania or raw the day after where Hogan would put rock over, but the NWO would use that to get their heat back. That timing would have been better anyway, because they would need a big follow-up angle and could keep rock off TV for several weeks to make it mean something rather than to have him rush back only four weeks between pay-per-view shows. So I kind of agree with Meltzer. The promo was enough for me. I didn't need the angle. Did you feel like that was too much of the good stuff to have Hogan use the, uh, the big rig there? No, I, I think that it was. Just adding another layer to the story. We should also add, I think in reality, behind the scenes, the rock needed to be off a couple of weeks to do Scorpion King promotional work. So there's probably, we're tra- probably trying to kill two birds with one stone. Let's get the NWO over strong and let them send a strong message. You know, let's do something pretty spectacular for raw, but also too, we've got to have something for the rock to have an explained absence, right? That helps. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's it's for for Rock to be gone. People needed to to be able to understand why and give that credit. Give that credit to Hulk. So we know now it's going to be Austin Rock uh, or, or um, Austin Hall, and I think a lot of people who are listening to this want to know why Hall and why not Nash. Was it odd to bring in Nash and really just have him there to be a corner man for Scott? What can you tell us about? I mean, you just assume, you know, if you go back to the, the beginning of the NWO, it's hard to imagine Hall and Nash being separate, first of all, but then maybe everybody's got a match, but Nash, I don't know. That feels like he's the odd man out. How did Kevin feel about that? How did you guys sort of break that out? All right, here's our plan. Well, there's not one. You're just going to kind of be there. Well, he wasn't there. He was in Scott's corner and he was a part of the NWO. So it was kind of a package where you saw one, you saw all three and you kind of knew that he was going to be involved no matter what you did. 
you know, who was wrestling the match in many ways was kind of insignificant. So it's written in the observer that Nash and Hall had a bit of heat on them coming off no way out quote Hall and Nash spent two days in Cincinnati earlier in the week in what appeared to be a political move. Some of the talent was upset at raw when they arrived late and in a limo, even rock and Austin don't get the limo treatment. Their side of the story is that they were asked to arrive at 11 AM for the pay-per-view to meet with the creative team about their roles in the show. The team never arrived until 1230. They were upset feeling it was a rib to test them. And as a result for raw, they were asked to arrive at 11 AM and instead they showed up at 2 PM. Boy, this is not exactly the best foot forward. Do you remember this? Not particularly, but I'm sure if they were asked to be there at 11 to meet with creative, and I don't know uh, what that would have been, that people would have been there on time. And when you look back at the history of tardiness and people being on time and not being on time, I think that uh, not being on time might lean in the favor of the NWO guys. Well... No argument there. Um, there is a rumor that occasionally the chairman has been known to, well, not always be exactly on time. He's juggling. Never. <laughs> oh my God. You can set your clock by him. Okay. All right. Uh, I mean, if you, if you want your clock to run, you know, really, really fast. Let's talk about some hypotheticals. Uh, hypothetical was Austin and angle ever considered as a backup plan. Because they, they had been working, you know, pretty consistently prior to this. And, and boy, there was, that seems like a logical pivot to me. If for some reason, the Scott thing didn't work out, the NWO didn't come in. Scott wasn't happy. Steve wasn't happy. I mean, look, Hey, shit, anything can be a pivot. Anything can be a, what if, but if you do your, do your business on, okay, what if we do this? What if we do that? And then, and everything is predicated on something screwing up. That's a. It's a tough way to do business. And at some point you got to pick them and go. Something I had no idea about, uh, Kurt said on his podcast, the Kurt angle show that he remembers there being at least some talk of, Hey, what if we got Kurt angle versus sting at this show at WrestleMania 18, do you remember having even preliminary discussions about bringing sting in every once in a while, there was a conversation about is Sting's contract or what Sting doing, but serious conversation at this point? No. So we're still gearing up for the brand split. That How... may have been Kurt just talking to himself in his hotel one night. Well, not... You're just being mean this morning. No, I'm not being mean. I'm just saying that that may have been just Kurt. Hoping you know, he could get to Sting. People and people saying, oh, hey, man, goddamn, if Sting was available, wouldn't it be great to work with Sting? Oh, I'd love to work with Sting. Yeah. Well, that's it. So we're gearing up for the brand split and it feels like going into mania, you've at least got to have a plan coming out of it for the brand split. I mean, Says all, who? well, we, we've had, <laughs> we've, I love you for that. We've heard a lot of times. And then what in wrestling, the idea being, okay, we're going to do this, this, and this, and then where do we go from there? Uh, so I just wanted to ask as far as this brand split, how paramount is this in your mind as far as. Hey, what are we going to do with this coming out of mania? Well, I think that more than anything, as far as brand split goes, it gives you the, the thought process of, well, we're going into Brown a brand split. So we can never have this match again, at least for a year. I got you. So get it out and, of the way now. Yeah. It opens up doors and it gives you a, it gives you a built in excuse. Well, if we do the brand split, you know, we're not going to get that. Mm. And it created a sense of urgency almost. Yes. And you also created a sense of now you got to get creative on the other side of this for this to possibly work. Undertaker's on raw and he's going to begin his push for a match against Ric Flair by challenging him to a match at mania. Is this something that Flair requested undertaker requested? I mean, I think the, the legend is undertaker said, I want to work with Flair. Is that the way you remember it? That is the way it was. Yeah, Undertaker wanted to work with Ric Flair bad. So, in your opinion, or in Vince's opinion, was Rick ready for that type of match? I mean, wrestling Vince in a no-holds-barred match at the Rumble feels a lot different than we're going to wrestle the Undertaker at WrestleMania. Rick wasn't, you know, Rick wasn't ready for it. And I think if you were to ask Rick, I think Rick had a lot of self-doubt as to whether or not he could perform 
at a WrestleMania level with The Undertaker. I think that Rick was the only one that had that doubt as Taker was confident that it would be a great match and, and everyone around knew, Rick, get your confidence back, man. You, you've got this and you're in there with Undertaker. You're, he's going to make sure that you look like a million bucks, which he did. And Rick has always been able to step up to the occasion and deliver. He may have self-doubt going in, but once Rick walks out through that arena, whether he's wearing a suit or a robe, it clicks in. He it's just he doesn't think about what he does. He feels what he does. Kane and Kurt Angle set their program uh, started at the next SmackDown. Um, is, is this is this more of a case of hey, we got two big stars here, we need them to do something, and we don't really have a plan, so hey, let's just put something here with these guys. It doesn't feel like that's like, I don't know, a long thought out, drawn out storyline. It's almost, all right, we got these two big stars. Let's throw them together. Well, they were big stars and you create a, you create a story out of it. You want, you want big stars to be involved in stories. And sometimes just by putting people together, you can create a story out of that. That's a valuable lesson. Uh, Austin ends up kidnapping Hall on SmackDown. You can hear more about that in our NWO episode at the archive. Is it hard for you to craft creative that you think Hall and Austin would like? I mean, we know that Hall at different times in his career was pretty vocal when he liked this thing or that thing. And Lord, we know that Austin had some strong opinions. Was it hard to try to, all right, let's put something together that we think Vince will like and Austin will like and Hall will like that feels like a tough task, Bruce. It is a tough task. And I, unfortunately, what, what happened here is that Vince had a vision in his mind and talent had visions in their mind, trying to get everybody to come together at the same time. It it just created a lot of, um, a drain on, on Vince's time to have to be involved as much as he was to get it to the place we needed to get to WrestleMania. I know we talked a little bit about this before. Uh, not too, not too long ago about razor Ramon and Scott hall, but in hindsight, and I, I understand we're going with the NWO here. Do you think it would have been a better setup or situation if Scott hall was using the razor persona here, meaning stone cold, Steve Austin versus razor Ramon, as opposed to stone cold, Steve Austin versus Scott hall. I think so. Because I look for me, I always loved the razor character. Yes. I thought the razor character was one of the best characters ever created and that Scott pulled it off to a T the razor character was loved universally, not love to love or love to hate, but the razor character itself was loved when people got Scott hall. It was just a guy mm-hmm. and that guy was very talented and that guy in the NWO worked, but I think that razor had more depth to him personally. So Billy and Chuck win the tag titles from Taz and spike to begin their build to their match at mania against the APA with all this talent. It doesn't feel as if the tag division is exactly at its strongest here. In my opinion, would you agree with that? I think that it was as good as it could be at the time. You know, it's, it's funny when, when people talk about the tag team division and, and what have you, um, there've been great tag teams in the time. And, and it's kind of like the business. Sometimes it just cycles through that yes. you, you don't have established tag teams and you try to create some from within. And that's what this was. So Jericho and Stephanie are going to come together now to combat Hunter Hearst Townsley or triple come H's. Together! Right now, do, 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 over me, diddly do, bum 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 bum, did, diddly do. And now you're dancing. He told Jam Football he got monkey finger. He shoot Coca Cola. He got. Yeah, anyway. I love when you get a phone message. It's like, hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> I'm singing my stupid shit, but. Oh, uh, what's Vince name? Let me see what that <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's fun for me. All right. So Jericho's got a quest to uh, defend his title. Stephanie's trying to gain revenge on her husband who left her at the altar. 
Jericho and Stephanie together, considering all the promos that we heard with these two leading up to this before they got together, I don't know that anybody would have called it swerve, bro. Maybe that's why it made sense. Was Stephanie overshadowing Jericho a little bit? Maybe, you know, Stephanie's a strong character and you better be able to step up to it. And she, she may have a little bit. I think that the emphasis here was to try and get Chris over and to try and get Chris in that spotlight. And with that strong of a counterpart in Steph, you know, maybe she was. People let me tell you about my best friend, not Bruce blue chew. And I'm telling you, it's going to be your lady friend's best friend too. She's going to remember why she fell in love with that rascal because you're going to feel like a younger, more viral man. Okay. Not really. Here's the deal. Blue Chew is not just for guys who have a problem. Blue Chew's for guys who are looking for a five-star match. Okay. They want to, uh, <clears throat> go a few extra rounds. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost daddy. Take them anytime, day or night. So plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Boing. And the process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com. Consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, bam, you'll receive that prescription in a few days. The best part, it's all done online. No visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Bluetooth tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. And I'm telling you, maybe. If you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform daddy, chew it and do it. Have some better sex, y'all. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free. When you use our promo code WRESTLE at checkout, just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is WRESTLE, and you'll receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast and brother loves hog meat. It's, uh, you know, it feels like it could, I guess I'm trying to figure out, could they have had a top program without her or did, I mean, clearly somebody felt like, well, God damn pal, we got to have Stephanie involved. Just talk me through that. Could it have worked without Stephanie? I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I absolutely love Stephanie as a television character, but it felt like the association somehow when she's with Hunter, it worked. I don't know why that is, but when she's with Jericho, it almost feels like He's having to compete a little bit with, with his own side, as opposed to against Hunter. I don't know. It, it felt like an odd pairing to me then. And now Yeah, to me, I think it enhanced the story okay. tremendously. So, um, it's reported in the observer that Scott Steiner had issues with his physical with Dr. James Andrews, and he's not going to be signed. We know eventually he does come in. But how big of a disappointment was this for you? Because I know you were, you were high on Scotty for a long, long time. And I can't help, but wonder, Hey, if this would have worked out timing wise, would he have done something at WrestleMania here at, at 18? I don't think anybody was excited about it because we still hadn't gone through all the process to see whether he was even able to come in at the time. So you have to temper your expectations and you have to temper your expectations until you get a clean bill of health, medical, um, whole nine yards. So three weeks out from mania, the show is completely sold out $3.96 million at the gate that broke the record from the year prior at WrestleMania 17 in Houston. Now the ratings haven't improved with the NWO debuting, but boy, the gate is super strong. Is that more based on the card or just the brand of WrestleMania at this point, in your opinion? I think it's a brand overall. And I think that it was timing, you know, things were turning, things were, were churning and things were hot at this time. So Christian attempts to retire on raw to Arn Anderson, but DDP came out and requested him to join him under his wing. What's the story here, Bruce? You've got one of the bigger stars in DDP from the WCW side of things, and we're trying to get him some traction and maybe there's some less than awesome moments that got us to this point, but now he's going to have Christian under his wing. Chat me up about this idea. 
Well, at this point, I, I think it was just trying anything to get people to embrace DDP and and care. And I don't think that our audience was was that into DDP and trying to to stack the deck, if you will, to steal a term from brother, um, just to get you know give him something else, man, give him something else to cling on to. Well, you say that, but I've always wondered. And I don't argue with it, that it, it, DDP and WWE didn't work, but I don't know as much that I believe that that was a DDP issue as it perhaps was a creative issue. I just thought that undertaker DDP thing was, I don't know, but would you, would you disagree with that? Yeah, but I also don't think that it was, you know, it was embracement of a gimmick versus not an embracement of a gimmick. I, I think that when you look at you look at it both ways. Ted DiBiase in WCW, did that work? No. Okay. But Ted DiBiase was probably one of the biggest, if not, uh, you know, ever in, in WWE as a million dollar man. What do you think that is though? I mean, if you, can you, put I think that, the, you know, as I've always said, I, I think that it is different brands have different fans. And WCW had its fan base, a lot of them who had never seen WWE before and vice versa. And if they had heard of them or, or they were a big fan and their favorite, you know, it's like a football or baseball team. You know, you love your team. Mm -hmm. You don't love the other teams. And so no matter what, when they come in, it's still not your guy. It's still not, you know, on your team. They've got to prove themselves on your team. And for guys coming in from WCW, for the most part, they had to prove themselves and they were looked at by WWE fans as the enemy in many ways. You know, you take Hall, Nash and Hogan. They all came from WWE. Yeah. They didn't have to prove shit. Our audience knew who they were. DDP, not so much. Well, here's my question on that though. Is the onus for the, is the onus for that on the talent or on creative? Both. You okay. have the greatest creative in the world. If the talent can't deliver it, then how good is it? You have the crappiest creative in the world. And if the talent can go out and deliver it, hit it out of the park, then it doesn't matter. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is what worked for DDP and WCW that didn't work in WWE. I mean, the diamond cutter was over still is Randy Orton's running around with that thing all these years later. And he's crushing. With I'm it. sorry. He uses RKO. Yeah. God damn. Come on, Bruce. I'm just yeah, trying Randy. to figure out what was the, what the, I'm not trying to have a Randy Orton discussion. I'm just trying to figure out what worked about DDP and WCW that didn't. And the audience didn't accept him. The audience was kind of like meh to him in WWE. They hadn't seen that build up in WCW and him come from nothing and do all the things that he did to them. It was like, yeah. And you're going against the undertaker, he was, he was brought in kind of based on, um, uh, you know, what he had done in WCW, but it was to the WWE audience. Okay. What have you done for me? And being brought in on top, which again, if you're okay. All right. Hang on time out. I think I'm picking up what you're putting down. Let me try to rephrase it. The WCW story was an underdog story of him overcoming and achieving. And the way we positioned him with WWE right away was he's a top guy, but almost cold because you have always contended that there were razor Ramon fans that perhaps weren't big WCW Scott hall NWO fans. So perhaps in your opinion, the brand loyal fans, they're like, wait a minute, this guy's a top guy. They hadn't maybe seen the under the underdog story and him overcome and achieve. And that's just not the creative we went with because we assumed we being wrestling fans who watched both programs and maybe creative at the time. Well, everybody knows DDP is a top guy in WCW, but perhaps this audience didn't know that. Well, didn't care either. You got to prove yourself in our yard. And sometimes, you know, one of the biggest mistakes, uh, that we have all made um, a lot is bringing someone in, assuming they're over. Yeah. And you, you got to still get, get people over to a new audience, no matter who they are. 
So Rob Van Dam is going to win an intercontinental title shot at mania by defeating big show and Lance storm in a three-way dance. So now it's going to be Rob Van Dam versus William Regal. And that is quite the styles clash. The observer would speculate the reaction internally from edge versus Regal at no way out is that it was time to move on from the match. Is that how you remember it? Absolutely. Uh, jazz is going to defeat Molly Holly to retain the women's title, but it's an angle afterwards. That really is the story. Jazz locks on the STF on Molly after the match, which leads to all the agents coming out and bringing Molly out on a stretcher. Now here's the interesting thing. One of the agents is Arn Anderson and he's attacked by the undertaker and boy, Arn is bleeding a gusher. And the angle is essentially takers trying to find ways to make flair, accept his challenge. What'd you think of, uh, Arn getting a little juice here. Uh, I thought it was too much, but I thought it was a great story for Undertaker to picket Rick's friends and go after them to try and get Rick to come out and, and face him man to man. So Jericho has put over angle on raw to give him a big win going into mania. Uh, and then the observer would have this. There was a backstage shouting match after raw on February 25th, involving Jericho triple H and the referee, Brian Hebner. Jericho was apparently mad at Hebner for screwing up the finish of the angle match. Triple H then stuck up for Hebner and blamed the screwed up finish on Jericho and tried to get others involved to get heat on Jericho. Boy, this sounds like an ugly scene. Do you remember hearing about this? Yeah, I have no idea. It could have happened, could not have happened, but it's kind of insignificant. That shit happens damn near every week. Well, check this out. we get a little mess here. The APA go to referee Tim White's bar, the friendly tap in Providence, where they always do angles from whenever they're in town. When they got in there, they spotted a bunch of guys from chaotic wrestling playing the roles of, this is directly from the observer, drag queens and homosexuals. They had guys dancing with transvestites and hitting on each other. APA looked very uncomfortable, especially when a large man as big as Bradshaw hit on Bradshaw. And the segment ended with Billy and Chuck jumping the APA as it was all a setup. Bradshaw was hit with a pool cue and Farouk had a beer bottle busted over him. A pinball machine was also destroyed in the melee. What a scene. I mean, first of all, some of this stuff, boy, in hindsight, probably wouldn't have done, but the friendly tap and the destruction of Tim White's bar, that was like a staple of WWE programming for a while. Was it not? I think that we rebuilt Tim White's bar at least eight times over the years. The friendly tap had new TVs. I need a new pool table. I need a new pinball machine. Well, hell, let's just trash this one. And uh, the friendly tap was a friendly place to work and friendly place to be able to go in and get some nice atmospheric old tavern, old bar scenes. And uh, while, you know, some of the subject matter might not be done today when you look back at it through 2022 eyes. But uh, at the time, you know, it was some very hectic and chaotic things. So let's talk about the main event of the time. It's Austin versus Mr. Perfect. And boy, people were so excited, myself included. When I saw Mr. Perfect come back at the Rumble, it's like, holy shit, this is going to be awesome. The match here was really not that great. And I'm sure that I'm sure that Kurt and Austin in real life were best of friends. It feels like they had a lot in common. But after this performance, you probably had to be thinking, man, that Mr. Perfect thing, that was a one hit wonder at, at the Royal Rumble. That's sad to say, but what, what say you? Unfortunately, I think it was, there was the sentiment of you're so happy to see Kurt. You're so happy to see Kurt in this environment again, but you didn't see him in a one-on-one type situation. So there were high hopes. And unfortunately, I don't know if, if Kurt had missed a step or just was not into it at the time, but it was not good. No SmackDown is taped in Boston and it's a memorable show to say the least. Austin's going to chase the NWO away, which Meltzer describes as it's gotta be a rib making fun of Nash who has bad knees and you're making him run. And then Austin pulls out a gun with a net that doesn't work the first time. And it just looks terrible for the crowd. Eventually it works. It'll all be cleaned up for TV, but is this one of those moments? And I know that you've told us here on the show, I love live TV. Because if something, if there's a snafu, there's a mistake, it was meant to happen. It's live TV. Nothing can go wrong on live TV. But then when this happens, you got to be thinking, 
God damn. So thankful. This is taped. <laughs> yes. You prayed to whichever God you have in front of you at the time <laughs> and give thanks. So yeah, it was horrible. It was the hokiest, stupidest shit. You know, you, you envision things sometimes, uh, as, if it were a movie and you think of in the movie, oh man, you know, this guy, he's got something, he shoots it off and a big net flies out. It just floats down all over him and they're all tangled up in it. And it's great. That ain't how it works in real life. And nine times out of 10. And when I say nine times out of 10, I literally mean nine times out of 10. It doesn't go like that. You got to be on the money, everybody in their spot, shot at exactly, precisely the exact angle you're supposed to shoot it at and uh, with the exact same pressure. It was so many variables for it not to go right. The fact that it was taped helped us tremendously because, well, we'll fix that in post. Also later on in the same show, and I'll just read this whole section from the observer quote show pinned Regal in a non-title finish that had to be booked by Vince Russo. Regal hits show with the Nucks. The show then falls forward right on to Regal who is squashed and pinned. Booker was supposed to be doing a shampoo commercial for Japanese TV. Tajiri made fun of him, calling him Buckwheat on crack. Stephanie and Jericho had a segment where Stephanie starts yelling at Jericho that he didn't get her the right hand lotion. And at first Jericho is about to yell at her, but stops himself and went to get her new lotion. A uh, lot of, lot of stuff going on here, Bruce, the Japanese yeah. TV commercial. Come on, man. Yes. Cause Booker wanted to be a star. And so he, he had this opportunity to do this endorsement for Japanese shampoo. It was only going to air in Japan. See, only, okay, hang on. The big, like stars, the big stars only do commercials stars, overseas. Yeah. Like Clooney and, and, and those guys, they do ads overseas because that's where the big bucks is. Yes. So they'll, they'll do an obscure Japanese shampoo commercial because their, their star is so big in the United States that, God, if it were to be on a regular television, it would just demean them, blow everything out. Oh, yeah. They wouldn't be able to keep up with inventory and even, even big time companies. They still want to have inventory. How great is the creative though of Regal hitting show with the Nux, but then show like a giant tree, just timber crushes Regal. That's great. Creative. I love that. Wow. I thought so. I thought Booker T doing a shampoo commercial in Japan was great too. I'm sure you That's were... good. I'm sorry, man. That's good shit. I could just see you grinning ear to ear then. It and is. Now. That's good shit. So Flair attacks the undertaker after he beats Al Snow with a lead pipe and tells him he'll never wrestle him. But if he touches Arn again, Taker's going to find out why he's the dirtiest player in the game. Now you knew at this point you were getting David, uh, Rick's son. He's working in OVW at the time. Did Rick have any objections? Is he happy to have David involved? What do you remember of how that creative came together? Yeah. I mean, David was working in the warehouse and training at the warehouse at the time and, uh, for developmental. So we had always kind of intended on using David. That was an idea that undertaker had to put David in this storyline and Rick was fine with it. Everybody was. So eventually it's announced that the shampoo hair commercial goes to edge instead of oh, Booker. I, see, it's highly competitive in Japanese shampoo materials. I appreciate that you still have a good attitude about all this. So February, okay, come on, that's good shit. I'm sorry. I'm not arguing. It's, it's funny, but it does feel like these are two stars that like if Tajiri had this issue with, I don't know. It just feels like edge and Booker T man. These are world champs here. I mean, not at this point, we we're going to but... put a bottle of shampoo on a pole. Oh God. And whoever got the bottle of shampoo got the commercial. And, and, and a bottle of conditioner as a bonus. Well, that was going to be in the next ladder match because after the shampoo commercial, you got to do the conditioner commercial, but that was going to be a separate, separate issue. You can't do two pole matches 
in a row. So you had to put one on a ladder on top of hanging from the, the ceiling to whoever could climb that 42 foot ladder. And it was going to be a 42 foot ladder too, by, by the now, way. Is it true that you were also going to have Hornswoggle wrestle little Booker with a step ladder and a travel shampoo? Okay. Just because it was on a couple of sheets for suggestions doesn't mean it was actually going to happen. I got to tell you a step ladder and a travel shampoo horn swag on a little book that hits for me. Does for me too. So on February 27th, well, you say shot sleeve. I say Samson shot sleeve, Samson shot sleeve, Samson. Do you know that he pulled a gun on, uh, Jeff Jarrett on pay-per-view once. Okay. Just throwing it out there. All right. Okay. Hot. So February 27th, boy, big trouble, big, big trouble, big trouble, Jerry. Not the company, but the initials. A court in England uphold the original ruling that the WWF cannot use their initials for marketing outside of the United States. Can you believe that the Panda got over on you? Get the F out. I, I just, I still think in hindsight, this is one of the biggest stories in the history of WWE because it just feels like as far as legal battles go, Vince McMahon almost never loses, but couldn't figure this one out. It's so, so weird. Many ways it was one of the best things that ever happened to us. And, and it's not even a story really anymore. No, I, I don't disagree at all. I mean, it was such an easy transition and the catchphrase it all worked. We've talked about that before in the archives, but it's still crazy to think about. Uh, there's a tour of the far East where the WWF sells out the Yokohama arena with 16,000 fans, $1.1 million gate. Singapore draws more than 11,000 fans for 732 grand. Uh, and, and then they've even got uh, another show in Kalua Lumpur. I don't even know if I said Kuala that. Kuala right. Lumpur. There you go. 14, Kuala Lumpur. 14,000 fans. Uh, it's reported in the observer that Carl DeMarco has reached out to Bret Hart about appearing at WrestleMania since WrestleMania is back in Canada. I say back because the only other time this happened was WrestleMania six, 12 years prior. Quote, DeMarco suggested Bret Hart be the referee for Triple H versus Jericho's title match. The plan that was called for this to be unannounced was to sneak him into the building, not let any of the other wrestlers see him until he showed up before the crowd. DeMarco tried to sell Hart on the idea because that way there would be no tangible business advantage for McMahon. Hart's name wouldn't give the WWF any added revenue using the lure of the elusive surprise pop, which in Toronto, where Hart still might be the most popular wrestler more than likely would have been huge. This would have been tremendous. Do you remember it ever being seriously discussed? No. It's a great idea though. It's fun. It could have been fun, but why, why would you? Yeah. Well, it didn't even get as far as a meeting scheduled. Uh, Brad told DeMarco, he didn't think there was a way he could do it. The meetings canceled. And it never happened. Let's talk about where business is though, because 2001 is really maybe peak WWE business, but we just said WrestleMania here at 18 in 2002 is going to set a record overall. Is that the case? Let's take a look. February of 01, your average attendance is 10,462 a year later. It's 8,776. So we're down 16.1%. Our gates, well, those are down too. We went from 303,000 to 282,000. We're down 6.9%. And television ratings are down just a little bit too. We're doing 4.94 in 01. Here in 02, we're doing 4.58. So we're down 7.3%. SmackDown, a similar story, but not as glaring. 4.22 to 4.08. We're only down 3.3%. I would say that's probably negligible. But here's the interesting thing. We figured out how to sell these fans a little more merch, our average per head, how much money per person are we getting out of everybody who comes to the turnstile was $7 and 54 cents in February of 01. A year later, it's up 23.7% to $9 and 33 cents. And Meltzer would say because of the lack of nitro competition, direct comparisons are a little misleading. A more fair comparison would be comparing the second hour from each year which would reveal a more valid down 2.4% year to year decline. And this has been something that a lot of people have talked about, not just in WWE, but in business that competition makes everybody better. 
were you starting to feel a little bit of that in O2 or is it still so fresh and you had so many new players coming in and there's so many moving parts that maybe you weren't feeling it yet? Well, I think that overall you're still, when you talk about fresh, you still have to build these talents. You still have to get them over. And that's the key as well. There's an excitement, but you also are in a rebuilding process to try and get a lot of these new talents to a place where they will mean something. Meltzer would write with most of the crew in Japan and East Asia raw is going to take place on March 4th and Jericho, the undisputed world champion who beat Steve Austin and the rock the same night in December is announced as not appearing because he's out shopping for Stephanie Meltzer asked the question, have they ever castrated a world champion before WrestleMania? Looking back, Bruce, we did not position Jericho very strong going into the main event of this pay-per-view. If you had it to do over again, would you have changed some of this build? No, I think it was a good build and it was story. And again, that's something that, you know, people often forget to look at and the story, it made sense because you're talking about it now is that, well, if this is real, oh my God, in Japan in 1947, they had Carl Gott. It doesn't mean anything. It's story. <laughs> I don't know. Just well, there was this time I remember that uh, clip from Hershey here uh, with just one added thing. And I, I, I remember watching a match one time with Yishi Guzimawa against uh, Onaki. And Onaki had three kicks in a row. I hear you. So Hall and Nash are going to beat Austin and, uh, bloody him up before Hall hits him with a stunner of his own. I guess it's time for the NWO to get some heat on Steve. Um, let's talk about DDP and Christian. They're having these segments that are really not all that great from the observer quote, the Christian retirement and going with DDP angle is the brainchild of Brian Gewertz. Edge and Christian have always been friends of Brian's to the point that he has heat in the locker room, particularly when he'd script out the comedy stuff when they were together that got him over. There is heat over the mania lineup in the locker room with Christian and pages, TV time, making people think they will deserve undeservedly get on the show, particularly if the Hardys and Dudleys don't get a program. Actually, I figure Hardys and Dudleys will get on that show at the last minute and some sort of tag team deal that they always throw out there. Because Manny is the biggest money show of the year by far. They try and let everyone who has worked hard all year share in the big payoff. Is your buddy Brian booking Christian like this, Bruce? Is that what you think it was? Well, I think Brian was probably writing a lot of it, but it wasn't just because it was his buddy. Right. Just that's sour grapes creative, from creative guys. Shit. Yeah. In your opinion, that's just sour grapes from guys who you know, which yes, because they I think any time that they see someone getting some love or that they're, if they're not, then it's woe is me. So then we see the undertaker attack David flair during a training session with your brother, Dr. Tom Taker's going to drag flair into the bathroom, bloody him up and promise Rick that his daughters are next. Yeah. Uh, coming after me. Get next bitches. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I'm going to do it in Alabama too. I'm going to go and we'll drag her out of her, one of her mansions there. It's kind of down inter- through, down through the, uh, infinity pool what, what, right off Montesano mountain. How do you, I can't believe you remember that. I'm really impressed. I, it's the biggest mountain in Abilama and it's the biggest house. I'm really impressed that you remember that. It's the mansion on the mountain. So I refer to it. I think Rick used to call it on TV, uh, the biggest house on the biggest hill on the big side of town. That's right. I, I, I disagree with all that with regards to me. Yeah. But. Because you, it's, you, I know because you get upset because it's, well, it's the biggest in the state, biggest okay. in like eight states we'll, around. At we'll, least. I don't like just being the biggest in town. Well, I, it's the biggest in most of the country. Will you stop? Yeah. Well, you have more garages than most people. That's just not true. Doors. That's not true. Chat me up here. How fun is it in hindsight to take a look at this scene 
where Taker's attacking David down in developmental. Jay Briscoe's running around back there. How fun is that? Well, Jerry should be. Okay. There That's what go. he does. He's the Oklahoman beating up a flare. You know what I'm talking about? And actually, well, and actually it was in Connecticut. I'm talking about the Briscoe brothers, like the tag team. That's oh, out there now. Not yeah. Jack and Jerry. Oh, I'm talking about Jack and Jerry. Yeah. I'm talking about Jay and Mark. Well, Jay's in the background. So are the Maximo brothers. Anyway. I don't know. It was in Connecticut. We see angle versus Hunter in the main event. It's a steel cage. Uh, well, I'd rather have it be Jerry though. For, for my purposes, can it just be Jerry? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Meltzer would write triple H spiked Stephanie's favorite skin lotion. And she broke out. She threw a tantrum over how horrible she looked. Geez, they could have at least done a decent makeup job. So she looked horrible angle beat triple H in a cage match. That was nothing more than having us watch the head writer feed her ego. This was annoying to watch and not in a heat way. It's hard for these two not to have a good match. And while I won't say they succeeded, they had 1534 and the Van Dam match was better. Triple H had it won with a pedigree when Stephanie came out, beat up Teddy long, and then did the Terry Gordy spot on triple H. Since they do that spot in every cage match, it means little now angle was about to walk out to win, but Stephanie ordered him back in the cage and, um, well, she wants a hurt and put on triple H because she wants blood. Triple H obliges cuts his forehead. Now we have our third, uh, face blood of the night. Triple H makes a comeback with a DDT on a chair. And as triple H is getting ready to climb out, Stephanie came through the door. Like she's stone cold hitting triple H with a chair and crotched himself on the ropes. She nails him with a check a second chair shot, ties him up in the ropes. Quote, do you realize how many superstars they would have today? If triple H would have put any of them over this strongly, Stephanie dragged angle, uh, out the door to win. When this match was over, a blind man could see that this company was heading for problems and know exactly why. What say you Bruce too much blood, too much Stephanie, or is this just melts are not liking it. Uh, it's Meltzer not liking it. And, you know, I, I love it when, again, people criticize Hunter. Look at his WrestleMania record. He's lost more WrestleMania matches than anybody in history. Yeah. So there you go. It's written in the Observer uh, that it's obvious internally the NWO has been a flop. At this point, as we're heading into WrestleMania 18, did you feel that way? I felt we were heading for a crash. I felt that we were kind of heading, you know, we were on the other side of that hill and, you know, coming out of it, unfortunately it was, and, and it was cemented at WrestleMania 18 that Hogan was, was the one that people wanted. Was, was Hollywood Hogan salvageable or did you not think that creative was going to last either? I don't know. I, I think, I think Hogan in general, um, was salvageable because the audience was just so hungry for him at the time. I think that when you look at, uh, Nash, Nash was entertaining as hell and the audience loved him. I, I would dare say, I think that again, a lot of people in WWE liked the badass diesel more than Nash. I don't know it's it's semantics, but it's no, it matters. It's reality. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Hogan, it's discovered he's got a broken rib when he's going over the match with Rock and Pat Patterson down in Florida. Were you guys ever nervous that hey man, what if he can't go? Or did you know Hogan's going to suck it up because that's what he does? That's exactly what he does. And have you seen some of Hulk's matches? Yes. Okay, Hulk worked with broken back. I think he'll be all right. Oh, there you go. Uh, going into mania, a lot of people, myself included felt like Hogan and rock and taker and flair had the best stories going in. I can't believe you won't just acquiesce that this Hunter Jericho story could have been better. I mean, I guess in hindsight, you could probably come up with a lot of different things at the time. I thought it was very good. Well, raw on March 11th, um, is described as dog shit by Meltzer. And that's pretty fitting. Well, he would know if he reads his letters. This is the classic episode of raw where Stephanie has, uh, (laughs) 
They're arguing over a dog here. Stephanie and Hunter arguing over yeah. a dog. You ever argued over a dog? Not right before WrestleMania. Not when I was world champion. No. Yeah. The dog takes a shit in Jericho and Stephanie's office and Stephanie makes Jericho take the dog outside. He ties him to a limo. Of course, Stephanie leaves in the limo. And of course it runs the dog over. Now WWE doesn't believe in murder. So it only breaks the dog's leg. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come on, Bruce. Well, first of all, that had just happened in in real life, in the news. Just just so you know. Okay. And uh, oh, that was damn good shit. Because anybody that loves dogs, especially the way I love dogs, that would get me hot. Poor little fluffy. Oh gosh. You know what? Let's just go ahead and get right into WrestleMania. The the show itself, man, is always going to be remembered for that main event. Uh, I've watched it over and over and over. Not really the main event, but what should have been the main event Hogan rock. Uh, the readers of the wrestling observer gave it 66.3% thumbs up 19 and a half percent thumbs down 14.2% thumbs in the middle. Almost everyone agreed Hogan and rock had the best match. Uh, Flair and Undertaker came in second place, then Triple H and Chris Jericho, and lastly, uh, Austin and Scott Hall. The worst match poll, well, they thought it was the ladies, Jazz, Trish, and Lita. What a big-time show, though. The 18th time we've seen WrestleMania, Hulk Hogan back in Toronto, where he had two of the biggest matches of his career before with Paul Orndorff and, and, and the Ultimate Warrior, and now here it is. And, and Meltzer would say it was clear at the fan access all week that Hogan was going to be cheered like crazy but nobody expected all of the boos for the rock. Would you agree with that? You knew just based on the way fans were reacting at fan access, man, Hogan's over like Rover, but I don't think anybody would have called the boos for the rock. Yeah. Um, it was a little, it was a little surprising to say the least, but I, everybody, everybody did know and had, had the feeling that Hulk was, was definitely going to be cheered and cheered loudly. So Meltzer would say whether this or last year's match with rock versus Steve Austin was really the biggest match will be determined in a few months when the buy rate figures come out. But when Hogan, the next night in Montreal got a crowd reaction, that was every bit, the equal or better of the fame pop flair got in Greenville or triple H got earlier this year in Madison square garden. He at 48 had once again, become the spotlight wrestler in the country. Meltzer would say the day before the show, Vince McMahon changed the plans for the match and had Hogan take the WWF jet from Toronto back home to Tampa to pick up a lot of his collection for photos as video screens, uh, for the, the red and yellow ring outfits. Hogan didn't get back to Toronto until 2 AM the night of the show. Uh, McMahon wanted to have Hogan come out in the red and yellow in Montreal after the turn, the turn itself was already going to happen as was evidenced as a, uh, a heel like Austin and flair, but the result in people not wanting to pay to see them just because they don't want to pay and boo people they like. So I, I think this is pretty smart that, Hey man, we may have wanted him creatively to be a heel. The fans ain't buying it. Vince sees that calls a pivot. Go get your red and yellow shit. Does that throw a monkey wrench into all the plans? Sure does. Goddamn Montreal audience threw a wrench into it too. I think that we had a standing ovation and they cheered for 12 minutes before we could finally quiet them down so the Hulk could speak. That was amazing. It was amazing. Uh, the, the total gate in Canadian is 6.1 million, 3.8 in, in US here. The old so did what a seventy-five thousand dollar gate. <laughs> I appreciate that. The old record was three point five, so you're up three hundred grand, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. Your paid attendance is sixty-one thousand sixty-nine fans. Total in the building is sixty-eight thousand two hundred and thirty-seven. Uh, the all-time record for revenue was set the prior year for forty-two point five nine million, and a lot of folks are thinking, "Hey, man, this could be up there." Uh, let's run through the card. Uh, the dark match that day was Rikishi and Scotty too hottie and Albert beating Mr. Perfect test and Lance storm in three minutes and six seconds. I guess it's not really a, uh, 
a dark match. It's on heat, but still it's not on the pay-per-view. Uh, the actual show gets kicked off with Rob Van Dam and William Regal. Rob Van Dam picks up the intercontinental title in six minutes and 19 seconds. It gets two stars in the observer. Van Dam, uh, has his mouth busted open here or, or actually Regal winds up with a busted lip, uh, because well, you know, that's what Van Dam does. Um, I really enjoyed this match. I don't know why I know it's a styles clash and I know in the UFC, they say styles make fights, but I've always loved watching each of these guys individually and together kind of worked for me. what do you think as a WrestleMania opener, Rob Van Dam and William Regal? It was awkward and it was ugly. And to me, I like that. Yeah. It, it makes works. it real. Like, yes. It's not this smooth flippity flop, you know, high spot stuff. And, and it was something that people could go, okay, Hey man, he really hit him there. Yeah. Like, well, there's a reason for that. Cause he did. <laughs> <laughs> So I, the fact of the matter that I really enjoy both talent, uh, I thought it was a damn good match. Fun little footnote in the next match. DDP is going to pin Christian, uh, to keep the European title in six minutes and eight seconds. But what was fun for me about this is Christian is announced as being from Tampa because we want to make sure he doesn't get the baby face pop. <laughs> well, where would you rather be announced from? Well, Tampa. Yeah. Okay. Uh, star in three quarters when Christian heard, uh, that, um, you know, DDP praised Christian that even in losing, he didn't throw a tantrum. Of course, Christian throws a tantrum star in three quarters. Um, if you had it to do over again, do you think there was more money in DDP or was it just a square peg round hole in WWE? I think it was a square peg in a round round hole. And maybe if we had taken more time with the introduction of DDP and, I don't know, because um, I'm always I'm a big fan of DDP personally, and I've always liked him, uh, and I appreciated what he did, man. When you look at how hard he worked at, at the age that he started uh, and what he accomplished, kudos. Uh, I just don't know that the WWE audience was that into him, no matter what he did. It's so wild to me that he's such a big star in wrestling, but this is his only WrestleMania match. Uh, next up it's Maven and gold us for the hardcore title. And it ends up being a show long storyline. Now uh, they go three minutes and 15 segments and in in what Meltzer called a sloppy match. And he says, this was the first time on a major show that Maven wasn't able to be carried. It ended up with spike Dudley pinning Maven after both Maven and gold us knocked each other out with trash cans. After this match during the show, Spike lost a hurricane who was then knocked out with a frying pan by Molly, who then had a door slammed on her by Christian, who got rolled up in the parking lot by Maven, who hopped in a taxi and left with the title. And this is basically a way to let all these guys, as well as Godfather and crash Holly get a WrestleMania payoff. Meltzer didn't like it. Negative half a star. I mean, I thought this was fun and clearly somebody in WWE did because the 24 seven title became a thing again. And. As a fun little thread for a show, I, I, I could see this being fun. It's a nice little let me up, as you used to say, right? Well, I definitely like the escape in the taxi. Yeah, that's funny was the stuff. best part. Next and, up, and I'm being serious there, too. It really was. No, it's very creative. Uh, Kurt Angle and Kane are going to go 10 minutes and 45 seconds. Uh, Meltzer would say Kane tried to work with Angle like a wrestler instead of a monster. And the problem was it just showed how limited Kane really is as a worker. Uh, he got a choke slam, but angle got his hand on the ropes. Kane kicked out of the angle slam. It was a long ankle lock spot, but another rope break. The finish saw angle block a choke slam and turn it into a front rolling cradle using the ropes. The finish looked real sloppy two and a quarter stars, man. Kane has been an absolute monster. Maybe he didn't have the best storyline coming into this. Maybe he didn't have the right opponent. I feel the same way about Kurt angle. I mean. What a superstar this guy is. Now we know, don't worry, WrestleMania 19, he'll get his chance to shine. But this was just kind of eh for me. What say you? Well, again, I look at this as the same way that I did Van Damme and Regal, and that it wasn't pretty and it wasn't supposed to be pretty. It was the wrestler versus the monster. And, you know, to that, yeah, you tell the story that Kane tried to wrestle the wrestler and instead he should have attacked it as a monster. So there is a story there. And to me, it made sense. It wasn't pretty, but it felt real. 
So undertaker is out next. He's going to be taking on Ric Flair. They go 18 minutes and 47 seconds. Flair is going to be bleeding very early. Uh, undertaker cut his cheek here. Flair takes a big bump, uh, with, with a top rope superplex from the undertaker and undertaker treating Flair as the legend. He is picked up Flair at two rather than allowing him to kick out. Usually there's psychology that if a big star is losing to someone he feels is lesser, the bookers talk him into it by giving him a spot where he picks the guy up just to show that he was really better. Uh, I love when Meltzer tries to break down. Here's why they did that. Anyway, undertaker eventually juices, uh, flair gets a lead pipe from the motorcycle, hits him with it. Flair gets him in the figure four undertaker is going to break it. Eventually choke slams him. And it looks like flair's in trouble when all of a sudden one of the biggest pops of the show happened. And I don't think anybody would have ever expected it to be this way. Arn Anderson sneaks into the ring, gives the undertaker a spine buster and the place goes bananas. Probably the biggest moment of Arn Anderson's career at that point, a big WrestleMania moment, a huge reaction, a damn near perfect spine buster, but we're not done. Uh, he's going to close line at referee Charles Robinson after the match. He being undertaker, he's got a, a trail of dead guys now, uh, in his wake. The undertaker of course gets the win. Uh, the tombstone gets it done. It's a three-star match. And Meltzer would say as bad as this reads and as ridiculous as it is usually done for a one-sided squash to go this long, it was almost better than anything on the show. Now I kind of don't disagree with that, but I know that both myself and Dave, we're big, we're big Ric Flair marks, but this was like a really unexpected surprise because I think a lot of people, myself included thought, well, Rick's not doing these type of matches anymore. And yes, there was some Gaga, but this was about as good as it could have been. And afterwards is really the first time I remember seeing the undertaker sort of acknowledge the streak. He like holds his hands up in front of the camera. Like, wow, that's 10 and 0 now at WrestleMania, a really cool match, a really cool moment for undertaker for Ric Flair. And of course, for Arn Anderson, what say you, I thought it was excellent. I thought it was excellent in every way. I thought that undertaker remade Flair in that and, you know, gave flair all all the props that he needed and it looked like it was a brutal encounter on every single end so to that you know kudos to both guys wait any heat on these guys for going long just to recap the first match is six minutes and 19 seconds the six the second match is six minutes and eight seconds the third match is three minutes and 15 seconds angle and kane are 10 45 the next one with edge and booker t are 632 austin and hall are 951 Flair and Undertaker, 1847. Yeah, I probably had heat with me, but is what it is. It's not like you're going to be able to make the Undertaker do something he doesn't want to do, right? No, I'm not. <laughs> so next up, it's... Uh, I'm, kind of, I'm scared. It, it's Edge and uh, Booker T, and there's a great sign in the crowd. They're fighting over shampoo. Uh, no, a shampoo commercial. God damn it, get your <laughs> shit straight. See, you don't understand... <laughs> Then don't write a sign. If you don't understand what the hell you're talking about, it was a shampoo commercial worth millions and millions and millions of yen. Which is about $8. Uh, so the crowd was dead. Once the match started, uh, edge did get a big reaction. Of course, he's the hometown boy. Ultimately a series of reversals edge hits the implant DDT star in a quarter edge gets the win. Uh, it's just sort of there for me, Bruce, but man, we got a lot of star power on this show so far. The edge Booker T match was excellent. Next up, Steve Austin and Scott Hall. They go nine minutes and 51 oh, seconds. Yeah. Meltzer called it another sloppy match. Shockingly little heat. Most of the way Kevin Nash interfered a lot. Austin did a missed time stunner earlier. Nash pulled Tim white into the ring to, or out of the ring to uh, break the count. Nash came in and they double team very briefly. Austin comes back with stunners for both guys, but there's no referee. Jack Doan runs in Nash lays him out to stop the count. Austin backdrops hall over the top to the floor. And now about six referees run out and order Nash to leave in the ring. Hall hits a stunner, but Austin kicks out. Austin goes for another stunner, which was even more missed time than the first one. He finally delivers another stunner and hall tries to make up for it by jumping as high as he could in the air to sell it for the pin one star. This thing was snake bit from the word go. Was it not? Yeah, it was kind of ugly. 
kind of ugly to say the least. It just wasn't, uh, it wasn't good. This wasn't, this wasn't ugly. Like Kurt and Kane or Van Dam and Regal. This just, this wasn't fun. Let my family save your family some cash. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket, but we will save you money. It's not a matter if it's a matter of how much save with Conrad.com. Didn't feel good. Yeah. Yeah. It, let me recap something Meltzer wrote in the observer. Austin refused to work with Hogan at the beginning, which both hurt his star power with fans since rock got all the hype as the all time legend while Austin became the odd man out. But many wrestlers thought he was the smart one, particularly when host, when Hogan gobbled up rock, he ended up so frustrated over his creative, even with his match finish being changed during the week, he still flew home after mania and missed the TV tapings in Montreal and Ottawa. While he was not planned to have a major role in Montreal because the show was built around Hogan and rock versus Hall and Nash, he was supposed to do an interview, but nothing else. And it isn't as if there were major changes on the show that had to be made when he decided he was going home because he wasn't happy with the way things were going. He's scheduled to be back on March 25th. Now we've talked about when Austin got frustrated a few months later and wound up walking out of the company. But I don't think we've ever really spent time talking about the fact that he just went home after WrestleMania here. And this is a guy who had been the, you know, the company had been on his back for maybe not 13, but he stole the show there, but it was for 14 forward really. And now he sees new guys coming in and maybe he feels like they're taking his spot and he feels like there's maybe a less than main event. And here he is in a less than awesome match with a guy he had reservations about working with. This is really where some of these problems come to a head with Austin and creative, right? I think it was the beginning of it. Now, Steve was unhappy, but you know, Steve also thought, well, why am I going to be, you know, in the lower end of the mix? Let them have it. Yeah. You know, here, here you go. Let them have it. And we knew, you know, this wasn't, this wasn't Steve taking his ball and going home. We knew Steve was leaving. We knew Steve was gone. So that wasn't a, a big, Oh my God, it was okay. That's cool. We understand. Let's put some focus over here on uh rock and Hogan. What do you do after you have Steve Austin and Scott hall, one of the biggest stars in the world and one of the coolest guys that ever lived. Well, you have Billy and Chuck retain the tag titles in a four way over the Hardys, the Dudleys and the APA Meltzer would say the crowd was dead, but all the guys worked very hard. Um, two and a quarter stars, uh, Billy and Chuck are going to go ahead and retain, you know, this is one of those deals where it just feels like you've got so many talents and you've just got to get us, get them into the show as much as you can. And this is the era where WrestleMania wasn't seven hours and it's not two nights. We're trying to do as much as we can here in like three hours and change. That's a tough ask when you've got a, 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 a roster that's this loaded, right? You ain't kidding. It's, it's very difficult. And, and sometimes it, it's done simply for that reason to make sure everybody gets on the, on the card. And, you know, WrestleMania should be something that, uh, is special. And sometimes not everybody's going to get on every card. And that's just, that's just business. Next up, The Rock is going to beat Hulk Hogan in 16 minutes and 23 seconds. You know the story. We can't possibly do this match any justice. Go out of your way to see it. Uh, this was fantastic. Meltzer gave it three stars. Uh, I don't know how this is. If any- it had been in the Tokyo Dome, it'd be like 14 stars. Meltzer says, as mentioned earlier, this is a match that was probably great live, but won't hold up. It was similar to Hogan warrior in Toronto from a storyline, but Hogan warrior had far less sloppiness and missed spots, but this match had more consistent action and less resting. Hogan warrior was three and three quarter stars to be watching it. And a week later on replay, I felt embarrassed because it didn't hold up years later. It looked awful. Just like watching back all those Jim Duggan tapes when he was super over in mid South and going, how did I not realize how bad this guy was boys and girls listening to this. Don't listen to Dave Meltzer here. Here's Don't what ever listen to Dave Meltzer. Here's what else you shouldn't do. Don't watch this mouse, this match with the sound off. If you watch this match with the sound off, then you might agree that boy, this was not a great match. 
you turn the sound on and the fans become, I guess in basketball, they would call it the sixth man. They're coming off the bench, man. And they are making this match. If you, if you watch this match with the sound on and you don't feel something, you're not a fucking wrestling fan, Bruce. This was fantastic. Yeah, it was over the top and it was a moment. It was a moment in time. And it was one of those moments that will, like you say, we're talking about 20 years later and it was magic. It was just sheer magic. When you talk about magic in a moment that you actually feel in your bones, this is it. And I do think it holds up. We recently just did a, th- I know you're busier than a one arm paper hanger, Bruce, but we recently got Mike Kyoto, who was the referee for this match and Jim Ross, who was obviously doing commentary together to do a watch along for this over at adfreeshows.com. It's just such a match. It's so worth celebrating. I hope folks check it out but, and, and go watch this match. If you're going to watch one match from this show, watch this match and turn the damn sound up. Uh, but now we've got to have, well, a let me up match. It's jazz retaining the women's title in a three-way dance with Lita and Trish Stratus kind of is what it is. Trish is going to come out with a Canadian flag and maple leaf on her shorts. Uh, but you know, three-way dances are tough. And in this era, the women weren't featured as prominently. They go six minutes, 16 seconds. It gets a negative one star. And now it's time for our main event. I'll tell you though, Bruce, I can't imagine being Hunter or Chris, because after they saw the reaction from this crowd for rock Hogan, it's going to be almost impossible to get them back that high, that up again. Is it not? Yeah. Especially because his performers, they felt it as well. Yeah. They felt the energy. They felt the specialness of that moment. And, you know, even, even with hindsight being 2020, I don't know if I would have ended with that match. Anyway, I might have put it on earlier to to let people kind of come down from that high before you got to the last match. But it was definitely special and and yeah, I think it was a unenviable position for Jericho and Hunter to be in. Unbelievably, they go 18 minutes and 41 seconds. I say unbelievably because I thought Triple H always had to have the longest match at WrestleMania. That is not the case here. Uh, Flair and, uh, Taker went just a little longer, but the fans were filing out during this match in their mind shows over, uh, triple H sold his bad leg a lot. He came back and set up Stephanie for the pedigree. Jericho stopped him with a missile drop kick. There's some good wrestling here, man. There really, really is. Uh, and ultimately when triple H finally hit Stephanie with a pedigree, it gets a pop, but Meltzer would say probably a lot less than you'd think. I just think that's the positioning on the card either way. Jericho hit triple H with a chair, set up a pedigree of his own and triple H catapult him, but Jericho landed on the middle rope and came off and got nailed on the way down. Ultimately triple H hits the pedigree, gets the win, wins the title. It's a three-star affair. When it's all said and done, were you happy with this one? Yes. And I, and again, unenviable position to be in, but I think that they, made the best out of it that they could went out and delivered a hell of a match in, in a match. I think that the audience was happy with. And, you know, again, when you go back and, and look at it, if you were to watch this match before you watch the other in order, uh, I think you would have gone, God damn, it was a hell of a match. And it was and a good story to boot. So the next day, the show draws the best rating since the summer, a 5.28. It does a 5.18 first hour, a 5.38 second hour, really a big show. It's totally Hogan driven. And I don't know that anybody would have predicted a few months, a few years at any point that the night after WrestleMania, Austin is not on the show and it's all about Hulk Hogan. How are you and I mean, how do you think Vince is feeling after this WrestleMania 18? I know that the WWE boy, things change rapidly and quickly, and that's not just for WWE. That's just business and entertainment in general, but it feels like a a company in transition here, maybe after this show more than ever, because we're acknowledging, all right, that NWO thing, that's not really working, but boy, Hogan is let's go back to our roots. Let's go red and yellow. But where does that leave our biggest star, Steve Austin? And oh, by the way, rock really wants to go make movies. And we really want to 
strap the rocket, if you will, to Hunter, but God, that finish and that main event was just, it didn't feel as special as the Hogan thing. It feels like a company in transition here. Would you agree with that? Well, I think that we were in transition from the moment that, uh, WCW went out of business. That's fair. You know, it, it continued on, but I think that the feeling overall was one of happiness and that you look at a creation created in 1987 or not 1987, 1983. And even before that, that stood the test of time and the audience was still really, really excited for that, that character. And you know, look, Steve's going to get the same reaction. I think, uh, coming up, we don't talk about current things and it'll be way over the top because he's just that over. And, you know, Hulk Hogan withstood the test of time. The audience wanted it. They wanted more. That makes you feel good. And it also gives you, it gives you that latitude to step back for a minute and let things rest and let them absorb. And you didn't need all of that star power every night. You know, we've heard over the, over the years that the reason that John Cena, for instance, never turned heel is because Vince McMahon would say something like he's the one who feeds us, but now you you've made Austin and he's not happy. He's going home. You've made the rock, but rock, even during WrestleMania week, did an interview with Alex Marvez. And he was talking about how could he do acting and wrestling? And could he continue to do both? And rock said, quote, I'm as optimistic as I can possibly be, but I honestly don't know how long I can balance both. Having gone through what I did this past year, I did all I possibly could to balance both and it damn near killed me. So you hear that and you think, well, he ain't long for this world. Are you nervous about, Hey, who is our next top star? Because if Austin's leaving or he's not happy and now rock is really going to Hollywood and we tried this Hall and Nash thing and that doesn't seem to click and, and Hogan, we thought was going to be a super bad guy, but he's a baby face, but we know he's 48 and not in the best of health and working hurt. You gotta be wondering, damn, who's our next big star here, right? If you're not always wondering who the next big star is, you're not doing your job. And that that's a constant because you can think about now you can think about the next two years, but you have to be thinking about the next 10 years. And that's just reality. And that's a reality from the moment I got in the business. WrestleMania 18, what a special show. Uh, what we said at the top of the show, maybe a one match show. Where would you rank this one all time, Bruce? Don't say top five. No, because it wasn't top five, but it definitely top 10. And the reason it's top 10 is because of the moment with rock and Austin, rock and Austin with rock and Hogan. In hindsight, do you think Austin made a mistake? Not wanting it to be Hogan rock. I mean, Hogan Austin. Do you think? And it wasn't Steve's choice. I'm just trying to figure out, is there something, anything you could have done to make Austin happy here that would have worked and satisfied him creatively? I don't really know. I, I think that, you know, aside from whatever, you know, Steve was feeling that there was also the, the reality of you know, his body and, and what he was feeling physically that probably played a lot into Steve's decisions at the time. You're saying he's burnt out a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just, it's, it's fun to sort of what if it, and I, but I don't know, I don't know what you could have done with Austin to make him happy. It, it, I have to ask this and I, I know you don't remember, but if you had to guess, even though Austin was working on the seventh match and not the last match, do you reckon he was paid as a main eventer? I know sometimes as fans, we always talk about cre- the creative. But at the end of the day, this is a business. This is what guys are doing for money. And he's probably had a precedent set of he's getting one of the biggest payoffs of the year from his WrestleMania show, but here he's not the main event. Did that add to the frustration? How he was- I'm sure Steve was taken care of very well. Well, we hope we've taken care of you guys very well today. Thank you for joining us. As we talked about WrestleMania 18, uh, overall, I will always give this a thumbs up show. I know we like to sort of uh, inspect and dissect and discuss and break down and analyze, but this was fun for me. And next week on April fool's day, April 1st, we're hoping to bring to you WrestleMania 2000. What an interesting WrestleMania that was. Do you even remember what the main event was off the top of your head? I do not. This was the one where there's a McMahon in every corner. Oh God. It's <laughs> Triple H. Some of those I try to forget. 
Triple H, The Rock, Mick Foley, and Big Show are in the main event here. Lots to talk about. Hope we get to talk about that one next week. Bruce, this was fun, man. Appreciate you uh, squeezing a little time in for us today because this felt a little old school. Always. Always I listen had, to you. Had nothing but time. I just sit around and lollygag all day. I thought you were uh, sleepy, tired, and stressed. And lollygagging. <laughs> <Damn> lollygaggers. <laughs> hey guys, Eric Bischoff here, and just want to call a quick time out. I want to tell your listeners about what I've been telling everybody at over 83 weeks, quite a while now, about all the cool things that are happening over at AdfreeShows.com. The wrestling wars are heating up as David Crockett and Conrad revisit March of 1985 on The Book. Vince has brought WrestleMania 1 to life, while Jim Crockett Promotions is preparing to be back on TBS television. And you got Dusty Rhodes and Tully Blanchard on top. Magnum TA and Ivan Koloff for the U.S. title, $5,200 at the gate. And meanwhile, while that show's happening, WrestleMania is becoming a thing. And uh, the wrestling wars are about to heat up because just one week from now, you guys are back on TBS. Former WWE executive John Filippelli sits down with Conrad on an all-new edition of The Insiders and discusses his tumultuous relationship with Bruce Pritchard during his time with the company. Vince was trying to, I think there were times where he tried to sort of get us to try and work together better than we were. And I, I was quite candid. I was quite candid about how I felt about him, about that I didn't appreciate you know, him undermining us or me. And I uh, I would have no part of it. And I told him, if he doesn't straight his act out, I don't want you, he, he's got to go. Either he goes or I go. Ad Free Shows members recently got to chat live with the enforcer, Arn Anderson and hear stories of legends like the late, great Bobby the Brain Heenan. Sharpest, funniest, wittiest guy there's ever been on this earth. I could look at Bobby and go, hey, Bobby, you got a bump on your neck. Before I could get neck out of my mouth, he had to come back. Boom, boom, boom. And just hilarious. That's just-